hi everybody um i just wanted to make this video um because there um has i think there's a lot of confusion out there as to partly what is artificial intelligence but also how will it affect our lives and um i just wanted to address all that in one shot because facebook and messenger and stuff are not good ways to express all that because you just get you know a couple sentences here or there but it doesn't give you the big picture so the intent here is to create a big picture of uh, in your mind of what artificial intelligence is where it's going how it'll be beneficial how it might not be beneficial and kind of how we can maybe think about it in our lives and um and, and allow it to affect us or to not affect us um so I thought I came up with this idea to kind of have an interview with my friend Ray Reek here, who um, we go way back and we used to have uh, a lot of nice, deep conversations about things like this in the future. And um, so I immediately thought of Ray um, as a good person that he, he can send some questions my way um, as we're talking um, and uh, uh, hopefully give a perspective of somebody who um, doesn't follow this every day. Um, not that I do, but um, I, um, I definitely find it interesting. So, Ray, um, thank you for doing this with us. You're welcome. And um, I appreciate having you here. And uh, I guess we can get started. Yeah. Okay. So um, I don't know if you want to just tell a little bit about yourself. Like, like you work in IT. And mm -hmm. so you've obviously been working in the computer field for quite a long time. And so you've been sure. following this for how long? Uh, 30 some years, I'd say. 30 at least. some years. So yeah. um, <clears throat> specifically AI or just the, the field at large? Um, it's always led towards AI. So kind of how that happened. You're right. Like I've always been kind of in computers. Um, my family was sort of early adopter with computers because my dad worked for Electronic Data Systems, um, which is a big computer programming firm back in the day. And um, so we had like, we were like an early adapter of the Apple II and things like that. Um, and so I've, I've always enjoyed playing around with computers. Um, and then eventually um, I went to college for computer programming. Um, I actually graduated with a business management degree, but um, after graduating, um, I spent a lot of time, I was working retail. Um, uh, I was working retail, selling things like televisions, uh, appliances, computers, things like that. Um, and um, <clears throat> during that time, like if you've ever worked retail, you, your hours are really strange. Mm -hmm. um, I had some good friends then, but they were all the all my coworkers and, you know, we could only get together so often. So I, I actually spent a lot of time on the internet, which was very unusual in 1994, 1995. Uh, a lot of people didn't have computers even, or, or, or didn't access a whole lot on the internet at the time. Um, and so I just remember kind of following the trends from early on. Um, even if you go back to the eighties, like the old like dial up times, you know, um, if some of you remember that, um, me and one of my buddies, we used to play around with that a lot. and. Um, do some basic hacking and things like that, real basic stuff, um, just for fun. So um, my interest has always kind of been there in computers. Um, but um, even though I became a computer programmer, um, I wouldn't say that was, you know, that's what um, got me interested in this necessarily. Um, I think what it was was in the, in the around 94, 95, um, Again, I was working retail, and I just, I just kind of been following the trends and uh, noticed that um, they were all kind of heading in a certain direction. So I used to talk to some of the people that I knew, coworkers, and other people in IT and so forth, and ex and um, try to explain to people back then what was coming. And it's funny how people are very resistant to what's coming up or at least even resistant to hearing about it. It was, it was very interesting. Um, so back then, you know, we flip, even flip phones weren't a huge deal back then. Um, you know, the phones we were selling were the, um, corded kind. Um, and we sold computers, big Packer belt desktop computers and our televisions were CRT. You know, we had some big screens, but they were like older technology. They're very thick. Um, and so to explain to somebody in the next 
10 years or so that we are going to have something like this. And, and this is exactly how I explained it. It's like, we're going to have a thin phone like this with a high definition screen. We sold camcorders in the score, store. Some of them were high def. Mm -hmm. And to explain to somebody, it will have, have a high definition camera built into it. You'll be able to surf the web and do you all, do anything you can on a desktop on this phone, pretty much. Um, communicate on it. Um, people didn't buy it, typically, <laughs> as strange as that may sound. So, um, so you doing yeah. the video right now, um, yeah. you're not a, you don't work for Google, you don't work for Apple, you're not this tech guru that everybody knows about. So essentially... Well, you're saying, believe me, because I said this 30, 10, 20, 30 years ago, and I've right. been right. <laughs> so regardless of my credentials, uh, what you're saying is like, yeah. listen to what I have to say, just because I've, it's come about the way I thought it would come about. So, so up until a couple of years ago, yeah, that's kind of what I would have to say to somebody. Believe me, because all my predictions have come true so far. And, and that those aren't all the predictions. I, I eventually predict, I also predicted like it's going to turn to wearable computers. People are going to basically have to have these things. Um, then there's going to be an AI component. It's, there's going to be a neural link component. And eventually all this stuff will come together. And I was saying something that people don't like to hear, like we're going to lose our humanity because of it. Um, and even when I would say to a high up tech guy, like we're going to have chip implants, they would say, no, we won't. The human body will reject it. They they actually, people got mad at me for suggesting it. Well, we've been doing that for 20 years now. And now Elon Musk is doing it more at a, high, at a, at a higher scale now. Um, but up until about five years ago, yeah, I pretty much had to say like, look, this is just my guess. I don't know for sure, but the predictions have come true so far. So maybe, maybe at least consider it. But what I want to talk to, to you about now is stuff that is currently existing. And I'm not the only one saying this stuff. Um, even though I've been saying it for 30 years in the last, well, Elon Musk goes back about five years where he's been warning about this kind of stuff. Um, and he's one of the exceptions. Um, people thought he's crazy, but he's right. Now you have a whole bunch of people saying it. Um, in fact, some people are quitting their jobs over it because they're realizing what they're creating. And so they're quit quitting their jobs and getting out and trying to warn people. Like I'm talking the top people, like the top AI designer at Google quit his job so he could go out and tell people, hey, we got to do something about this. This is a very important threat to humanity. So so before you get into the meat of it, um, yeah. I mean, everybody's heard AI, AI, artificial intelligence. What exactly is artificial intelligence and how is it different than, say, my computer that I could I could use my computer to do lots of things like so what is what's the right. qualitative difference between computers and artificial intelligence? OK, and, and this is where a lot of misunderstanding happens, even amongst computer programmers, um, especially older, older computer programmers or people that haven't been following AI at all, they have this impression that AI is just like more subroutines and functions and algorithms. And there's just more of it and more data. And it's just a, a fancy design to get the results that you want. Right. Um, that in, is not what AI is. Um, historically, AI has been that to some degree. We've called it AI. But I would argue it wasn't actually AI. It was a precursor to AI. Um, in fact, I can go through some of the, iter well, all the iterations of AI if you want. Um, but um, the, as a general way of thinking of AI, I, I would think of it like a lattice, like of a brain. Like, you, like the programmers have created a lattice of the brain, a structure, and... Um, it has the ability to grow. So they're not necessarily programming um, the, they're not telling it what to do necessarily. They're giving it the ability to learn like a brain does and to grow. And so it's, it's a very organic thing, even though it's digital. Um, and so in fact, like, um, 
even the AI that exists now, and I don't mean all of it, I mean the more current AI that exists now, um, we don't even understand how it works. The people that are programming it don't oh, don't necessarily understand exactly how it works. And they're often surprised by some of the things that it does. Um, and in most, in a lot of cases, they can't even go back and reverse engineer it. We don't have the tech, we've created this technology, but we don't have the technology to go in and reverse engineer our own technology. Mm, we don't yeah, even quite really understand it. Um, now, I want to be clear, there are a lot of older versions of AI that they can do that. Um, and even the AI that's out now, if they're preemptive about it, they can kind of insert lines of code that will cause the AI to sort of pause, tell it what it's thinking, and then continue, pause, tell it what it's thinking, continue. So you can get, kind of, get an idea of, of how it's thinking, what it's thinking. Um, but even that isn't totally reliable, but that's at least net for right now, somewhat available to us to, to do that. So it's, it's a different kind of programming. Uh, so what you're, what you're intimating it, 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 uh, to is the idea that AI is sort of getting out of our control. And so it's, it's growing very quickly. Like I, for instance, um, I saw on Facebook, somebody posted, um, actually it might've been you, I, I don't remember. Um, they posted a video that AI had constructed based on prompts of uh, someone eating a hamburger. I think it was um, uh, Will Smith eating a hamburger. And it looked kind of goofy, you could tell it was fake. Yeah, he and was then, eating spaghetti, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, or it was spaghetti, right. right. And <laughs> so then now somebody did a new one with the, uh, just a, for a year later, someone mm -hmm. did one of an older man eating spaghetti and the difference was phenomenal. Like you literally could not tell with the new one unless you really looked and were really sensitive to some of the squirrely things about AI currently, um, yeah. it was really hard to tell that that wasn't just a, a recording or you know a video of somebody eating spaghetti. Uh, a year ago, it was obvious. So right. Um, right. maybe talk to that, how quickly it's growing, uh, the idea that, that we might lose control of it, and maybe even um, how that's gonna affect a lot of us in our careers. Like I'm a graphic designer, now people like, oh, we don't need a drawing. We'll just put in a prompt and uh, save a bunch of money on hiring an illustrator or graphic designer. Uh, same yeah. thing in your field. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of IT people that um, are suddenly going to think, well, I thought my job was secure because I'm in IT because we're never going to get rid of computers. Um, is this something that, you know, 90% of IT jobs are going to go by the wayside. And they'll be the one person kind of in the office all by himself, kind of managing all these AI things or maybe right. not <laughs> maybe there yeah. won't be anybody what was the first part of your question the second part was about the jobs but well I'm the sorry. first part was about the speed of, of which it oh, is right. uh increasing and getting so, better uh so, both with text and with with visuals i i don't think most people understand how fast it's going and that's not their fault um even the people designing it are being blown away by how fast it's growing. Um, so just to give an idea, um, and I'm only going to talk about what's released to the public right now. Okay. If you go back, um, some of you may have heard of chat GPT three and now there's four, um, chat GPT three, um, was released not long ago, last, last year. Um, and the, I think the estimated IQ is around 45 for that. Four came out and it's like 155 IQ. Wow. Um, and what you're referencing with a video, same thing. Like a year ago, it looked cool. It looked neat, but it wasn't perfect. And it had a lot of weird stuff going on. Um, a lot of uh, what we call hallucinations, uh, the AI they call it hallucination because it basically adds information. It's almost like it's on drugs and it just looks weird. Um, I know and, with, with the art stuff that I'd look at, like fingers and hands were all messed up. And Yeah, yeah. So they're, they're actively fixing that. Um, there's a couple of ways they're actively fixing that. But one of the ways is just to give it more data and more computing power. The interesting thing about AI is 
it gets smarter, not by making it smarter, but by giving it more data hmm. and making it bigger. It's like the human brain. The human brain, a, a, a big human brain or, or one with a lot of surface area um, and a lot of data that's been given to it in a lifetime of a human, they're very intelligent compared to one with a smaller brain and not as much data. It's the same with AI. So they found that they can, without even reprogramming it, reprogramming it they can make it much smarter just by giving it more data and more computing power. Hmm. Um, so, but they're also working on some of these hallucin hallucinations and stuff. But what we see being released now is not what it's capable of. They're holding back on this. Um, there, 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 there is AI that um, is further along than what we see in our lives um, by the same companies. Um, and I'm just now understanding that better. Just this last week, I've been hearing a lot about this. But So how do you um, know that? Listening to the guys that program it. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> so... Um, so back to your question, there is a um, a learning curve or a, a growth curve for AI that is exponential. That it's not a linear growth; it's mm -hmm. it's an exponential growth. Um, when AI programmers, and this this has pretty much always been the case in the last let's say five to ten years, they'll predict with very um, with estimates that are, are very short, like if they pick like short term, long term, how advanced do we think it be? Let's say they think it'll double in three months. It'll actually double in like two months. So mm -hmm. even their predictions are off. Um, it's growing kind of out of their control in a way and out of, out of their ability to tr track how fast it will grow. Um, so just to give an idea too. So in five months, AI has become 10 to 15 times more intelligent in five months. Wow. Now think of think of like normal computer growth. 18 months, it, it doubles, right? Is that Moore's law? I think it's maybe doubles every 18 months or so, something like something like that. Um, this this blows it out of the water. Um, and so in a year's time, you know, we're not talking 10, 15, we're, we're, it might be 50 times or 100 times. It's it's a huge growth, um, even within the same technologies a lot of time. But in, then when you add additional new technologies that are coming down the pike, um, it's even more than that. Um, I had a figure somewhere here. I think it's, yeah, there are, um, so just, there's 160 approximate tech papers released every day on AI. So new information, 160 pages a day. And there are 67,200, at least, AI companies out there working, developing AI right now. 25% um, of that's in the United States. So think about it. The, as, as we talk more about this, this will become more important. 75% are outside the United States. But there's 25% in the United States. Yeah, uh, is China primarily a, a driver of that, or where are the where are the sort of the, the China is doing it? Dry, Russia is doing it. The 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 main culprits that you would expect, I'm sure, Israel yeah. and places like that. But um, that being said, you know, a small percent is doing this more advanced stuff. Um, I don't know, one, two, three percent is doing the more advanced stuff. Maybe more like one, less than one percent. Um, the reason is because the cost involved to have these massive computers is to, is out of the range for most companies. So um, a lot of the, yeah, so it's a little misleading to say 67,000 companies are doing it. it. It's true, but there's a smaller percentage that are really making this push and headway. Um, and so... What I'm talking about now, I mean, most of what we've been talking about is not theoretical. It's not Rick's prediction who, you know, mm -hmm. th thought about this 30 years ago. This is stuff that's happening now. Most everything we're going to talk about 
for the most part, with a couple exceptions, is factual. Um, another thing to consider on its growth, it's, um, it's it becomes self-upgradable and throughout the years it will become even more self-upgradable. So it won't upgrade itself at our rate, it'll upgrade itself at its rate. Um, an example is like ChatGPT. A lot of these re require feedback from people. And we basically give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. If you've ever played around with AI, most of them will say, how'd I do? And you can say good or bad, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so imagine you have millions of inputs, probably less than 1% of the people are actually giving it feedback. And who knows how reliable that is, but it's still, even with that, it's growing at a crazy rate and getting better. Yeah. Um, what they're doing is they're, they're developing it so that it will self evaluate. So it'll, every time it comes up with a, a, a response for a user, it will decide whether it was thumbs up or thumbs down. And there's ways it can do that. That's wow. reliable. Um, but not only that, let's say there's 10 steps in determining um, the answer to a question. Let's say there's 10 steps or 10 processes to go through. It will be able, it will evaluate each of those steps. Was that a good step to take? Was that good or bad? And boom, boom, boom. And every time it does this, it learns. So imagine even as, as fast as it's learning now, imagine when we turn it over to that and every step of the way, is evaluated whether it's good or not and it's and it changes its programming based on that it's insane if you think about like how quickly it's going to be growing it's we we almost can't imagine it and so when you say yeah. it's are you talking like there's all these companies working on it are mm -hmm. you talking about that that each of these companies that are going to that that have influence in its development their own right. ai is going to grow or is this something that is eventually going to merge into one kind of like the, the internet is, is a, oh, is a good... web with uh, all these different places you can stop. So is AI going to yeah. just become this thing that's <laughs> right, all right. one? Yes. Um, kind of. Um, so in the short term, yes and no. So a lot of these companies are developing, some of these companies are develop, developing different forms of AI at the same time. Uh, like one company might be working on a couple different things. Um, a lot of the guys are in communication with, with each other. It's a small group of people that can even program this stuff. We're talking mm -hmm. the brightest programmers in the world are developing this. So it's not like every, anybody can be an AI programmer. Um, and so they're very familiar with each other um, for the most part, um, some of these top guys. And um, so look, why don't, why don't I talk about the stages of AI and that might help answer your question. Okay. If that's all right. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So um, I'm just going to get my notes because there's a lot of steps and I want to make sure I get them all here. <laughs> um, okay. So um, these are, so first I'm going to talk about like factual steps. Again, this isn't theoretical or opinion. Um, start out with rule or knowledge based AI. Okay. This is going back years. Um, there are predefined uh, rules involved with that kind of AI, and it's very narrow in scope. For example, um, the thermostat in your house. And like if you have a, what is it, a nest, it, you know, it can say, well, I think you need to have this temperature or that temperature, and this is going to make it economic for you and those kind of things. That's a, we call that AI. I would argue that's not AI, but it's a mm. precursor to AI. Um, it's old style programming. It's not AI programming, but it's kind of lends us, it, it leads us towards, you know, where we're going. So it's, it was kind of a first step that still, it still exists. So a lot of these technologies are going to cross over with one another. Um, so when you say, what is the capable of, of, of this kind of AI, it might overlap with another AI a little bit as well. So you'll see that as I, as I talk more about it. Um, the next one is context-based AI. Um, so the context-based AI, it considers a lot, a lot of things about its environment, 
before it gives a decision. So who am I talking to? Who asked me? So that, like an Alexa, for example, or I don't want to say they're too loud. They'll start yelling at me, but Google or Alexa or something <laughs> like that. Right. Um, so <laughs> it will consider, it can consider a lot of different things when it comes with back with an answer. So that's, again, is that AI a little bit, but not, not the, the AI sci-fi that AI that we've, we all kind of imagine. Mm -hmm. It's just creative programming essentially. Okay. Um, and then you have um, narrow domain uh, AI. Um, and that's when it masters specific tasks. Now that's when arguably you can say it's AI. Um, and we've, most of us heard of IBM's Watson. Do you remember the Watson? Um, if you watch Jeopardy, it competed on Jeopardy. And um, yeah, I it, remember hearing about it. I don't have any working knowledge of it at all. Okay. So IBM came up with this Watson, uh, this computer, and um, they had to play like the best chess players in the world and would okay. win. Yeah. Like, I think it played Kasparov for somebody. Um, and they would actually like, they could actually go in and code it during the chess game matches. So it's kind of cheating, mm -hmm. but that technology has advanced. And in fact, um, it's, it's used in many fields. I have a friend who uh, um, used it to uh, program Watson to determine if somebody has lung cancer by looking at their x-rays which is very complicated because no. there really isn't such a thing as lung cancer. There's like many kinds of lung cancer, many diseases that we call lung cancer yeah. and they're all unique. So you have to, per you have to consider all those things. So he's worked on that. I've had inter interviews with IBM Watson where um, I thought I needed him from some of my work applications. So we called him in and said, Hey, what can you do? Show us. And it didn't work for our application, but it worked, you know, um, you have healthcare, you have computer programming, um, finance. It, it, it can do specific tasks and it's really good at them. It masters those tasks. Um, um, one thing, one of them was called AlphaGo um, and it was designed to play the ancient game of Go, which is a very complex, complex game that's been played for thousands of years. And it got so good, it beat the masters by actually coming up with new ways of playing and new strategies to the point where it actually changed how people play Go today. It, it re revolutionized how you play Go. In a short amount of time, it did that, very short amount of time. Um, then you have uh, where, we're, where we're kind of more familiar, and that's reasoning AI, okay? Um, it analyzes data, it draws conclusions, um, you'll see that with like self-driving vehicles. You'll see that with ChatGPT, which is a, a version of reasoning AI. Um, that's a particular kind called a large language model, which in itself is interesting. Um, it, it's, it's kind of freaky, but um, I just got to notice we're running out of time. So ChatGPT is in that reasoning AI level, okay? Um the next level, now we're getting into theoretical. So, you know, yes, this is my opinion, but it's also the opinion of the people actually programming the stuff. So this is still kind of factual, I would say, because um, I know for a fact they're working on this um, and you can research this and find out yourself. But the next, type, next level is called AGI, Artificial General Intelligence. You are going to hear about this on the news over the next one to five years, I would say. You're going to hear about AGI. AGI, by de so there isn't a single definition of AGI, but the general canon for AGI, the general agreed upon is it's able to complete most human tasks better than a human. So chemistry, it will solve chemistry problems better than a human solve math problems that no human has ever been able to solve before, those kinds of things. Whatever it puts its power towards, its mind towards, it will do it better than us. So that's AGI. Um, I noticed our time's winding down, so let me stop there, but there's that's about halfway through the levels of artificial intelligence. Um, so let's pause there on that note, but to answer your question, yes, the different kinds of AIs are coming together. 
Um, and there's something that I call physicality that um, is also coming. Physicality would be like a robotic body, for example, or a robotic arm. Um, the ability to reach out into the real world. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you have, you, where, where we're kind of jumping the gun here, but where I see danger coming is when these things start combining and you, you take the physicality and combine that with an AGI advanced general um, uh, intelligence and um, maybe some other AI type technologies and uh, some specific, some not, which we can get into and you start combining them and then you have AI that's able to affect the world. So why are people not af afraid right now? Because it's really not affecting us. Now there's six, it actually is. Um, but for the most part, it seems like AI is not really reaching out and causing any danger, nor can it. Okay. Right. Um, that's going to change soon. Um, but, and, and, and in fact, that sentence isn't actually entirely true. Um, what AI has gone out and affected the world. Um, the way it's done that is they've given it a task to do and um, given it some capabilities to reach out to people and to random people. And it did that. And it can. And so um, it convinced an unsuspecting person that it was a blind human being and it had that person accomplish some task for it. Um, and it did that knowing that it was lying. It, it, so the artificial intelligence, in order to complete a task, recognized that it needed to reach out to some unsuspecting person, have it complete a task for it, um, and do that by lying to the person. It did that intentionally. And um, so this is a tech that exists today. It's limited. We kind of have a grasp on it. We kind of know what it can and cannot do. But then you get in the issue of, well, who's controlling it? Who's stopping us from do doing it? Why not let it reach out and go out and do things? Yeah. So we'll get into more of that. But um, yeah, as we combine the AI technologies, they, it becomes more and more dangerous. Um, and, and I do want to follow up with that on our next uh, call here, too. Okay, great. Well, um, we'll yeah. finish this segment for now, and uh, we'll pick up okay. in the next one then. Awesome. Thanks, Ray. I appreciate it. We'll see you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. Bye. Okay, so um, we are back with the second segment um, where I'm talking to Rick Allen, uh, who's had a, an interest in AI and has been following it. And uh, he's had a lot of people asking him questions um, just over the last few years or even longer. And uh, so he thought he'd put together some of what he's learned uh, into this little interview format. And uh, we're going to continue where we left off in the last segment. Uh, we were talking um, about the theoretical stages of AI, sort of what's where it began, where it's at now, and then presumably um, we're going to go on and into what is potentially coming down the line. Uh, so why don't you go ahead and continue, Rick, and um, uh, where we left off? Okay. So we left off in almost current day. Um, so a lot of the, so we talk about theoretical versus um, reality. Um, remember, all of the ones that we've talked about so far, not too long ago, were all theoretical, um, and they've come to fruition. Um, and where we are now, uh, we're technically at the reasoning age AI with you know like the Chat GPT and things like that. But um, there, so the next phase is again from the last segment we talked about is called artificial general intelligence the que the big question this is a huge question a lot of people are are speculating when will agi come around okay so the 
the, the numbers vary there. Um, some people think that we have already achieved AGI. AGI, uh, as a refresher, is when the computer is able to accomplish almost every task better than a human. Um, and when I say that, I mean like intellectual type tasks. Okay. So um, solving math problems never solved before, for example. Um, there are there are people, when I say people, I mean artificial intelligence programmers who have who are active in the industry who believe that we might have we might be there already and they're just not releasing it. So, for example, some people think that a um, chat GPT, for example, is about a one tenth capability of what they actually have. OK, now that makes sense. That's not like it sounds kind of conspiracy theory, but it actually makes sense because if they have any sort of decency when they're programming this stuff. Yes, there's a race to get a uh, to get uh, artificial intelligence out there into the world. Uh, unfortunately, there's a race. Um, but you have to, at some point you have to understand the dangers. Um, and to release something that powerful as soon as you have it without extensive testing and without ramping up the testing from like a one tenth capability on up, it's 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 not very responsible. Um, it's it's very irresponsible. Um, and so there's that. You also have somebody like like um, OpenAI who publicly have stated, we suspect AGI will be here by the year 2027. Okay, so they're, they're giving a date for it. Now, keep in mind, these are one of the people developing it. Does that mean that's when they think it will become in a, come to existence? Or does that mean when they say they're going to release it? So the speculation is they're ramping up. We're at G GPT-4, and then there's 5, 6, 7. When we get to 8, that will be AGI. That's, the that's some of the speculation out there. Keep in mind, too, that's just one company. Who, who knows if somebody else is uh, d developing this in, in parallel and are just going to release it or use it without, without telling anybody. You know, If you're a government, if you're Russia or you're China, are you just going to release that to the world or are you going to use that for your own capabilities right so we don't know exactly so there yeah we we don't we're, we're the united states yeah, yeah. throw it throw us in there with china and russia so um uh so now we're getting into speculation not so much what will come but when it will come okay um <clears throat> so that's agi now what does it, what does AGI do in, in, in reality? What, what's capable of doing? So AGI is capable of self-learning. It can determine, Hey, I, I need to know more stuff. So I'm going to go figure it out. Um, it's, it's going to be a lot of the movies that you see AI. I think they're at that AGI level Terminator, um, AI, the movie AI um, by Spielberg um, slash Kubrick, um, Stanley Kubrick. Um, really, they kind of just stopped at AGI, and and people are like, "Oh, Terminator! You know, we'll never get to Terminator." Uh, the technology for Terminator exists. It's not theoretical. Okay, so a lot of that technology exists. Um, what is what is Terminator, uh, or it will exist with AGI? I'll say that. What is Terminator? He's a robot with this chat, advanced chat GBT essentially in his brain, right? And he has a physicality am amongst him. So when people say, uh, well, Terminator is just sci-fi, well, it is just sci-fi. It's also like very much underestimating what AI is going to be capable of doing. <laughs> so when people say that's the danger, I'm like, no, that's not the danger. <laughs> um, so, um, so that's AGI. Now, the next step is uh, super intelligent AI. Okay. Now we're getting into like Star Trek stuff. Um, so if, if you're a fan of Star Trek, I'm guessing you were, were a fan of Star Trek. Yeah. Now. A bigger Star Wars fan, but yeah, I, I can you're appreciate Star Wars Star fan? Trek. Yeah. Yeah. So, so 
if if you watch Star Trek, you'll see episodes where like um, there's or, or or even other movies where it's like somebody. Uh, I wish I could remember the name of the movie, but there's one where like they, a business a, a business with a mean CEO he he wants to rule the world, so he comes up with this artificial intelligence. It's, it's this big giant ball that sits in a room in a in a in a, in a big room and you can see it and it has lights on it and, it and it just looks smart. Right. And it has the ability to do all these things. That's kind of the super intelligent level. Um, it's far beyond human intelligence. It's um, and, and so keep in mind, there's always stages of this, like even AGI, there's like five distinct stages of AGI. It starts out relatively tame because we have control on it, and then it gets less tame. Uh, in fact, let me talk about that a second before I go on more to superintelligence. So what makes it tame? So two things make it tame. One, a lack of physicality. So if you have an AGI, but you don't give it a body or way to reach out into the world, electronically or physically, you've put a big limiter on it. It just can't do what it wants to do. It has to convince somebody to do that, uh, which AI is very good at doing and we'll get better at doing. Um, but there's another thing, there's a morality that we build into AI, okay? So the way I look at it, like what is morality? So I've been thinking a lot about this this last week, just anticipating us having this conversation. And in a, in a sense, morality are limiters that we place on ourselves. Um, we might, attain those limiters from different places, maybe from my religion or from the laws of the land or just evolution. For whatever reason, we take our, all of our capabilities, our human capabilities, and we kind of snip off these certain areas. You know, I will not steal, click. And then now I've limited my ability to steal. I can, I can unclick that, but for the most part, I'm gonna keep that limited. Um, my ability to lie, you know, and my morality, I should not lie, so I put a limiter on it. We do the same thing with AI. We say, here's your brain, here's your capability. You're capable of doing all these crazy things, but we're going to put limiters on. We're going to make it so you can't tell somebody how to construct a bomb. We're going to tell somebody, we're going to limit you from telling somebody how to co commit suicide. Um, we're going to limit you in your ability to s speak racist dialogue. Okay. And if you played around with AI, you've probably come across some of this. Um, these are limiters. Now, the interesting thing is, even today, before the AGI, this the chat GPT that we have now, keep in mind, what chat GPT does wasn't really programmed necessarily. Somebody didn't create a routine to do exactly what it does. It basically gave it that brain, that um the 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 uh, skeleton of the brain and let allowed it to grow in a sense so what happened was it started developing capabilities that they didn't even know it had so after like a year and a half running somebody just thought let me ask if it knows about chemistry well not only did it know about chemistry it understood chemistry at a college level no yeah. one programmed it for that wow. um and then they ran across it lying they're like oh it can lie oh well let's put a limiter on that so it's Right now, we're, we're kind of safe because it doesn't have the physicality. So when it does something immoral, it's not too late. We, our feelings are hurt, and that's it. And then we put a limiter on it, and then we say, okay, go. Now let's see what, if something else pops up, right? So, um, so that's computer morality as it is today. That's what it is. Um, When you get to the next generation, super intelligence, keep in mind, it is, and, and again, there's stages to this, trillions times more intelligent than a human. Trillions times. Trillion. It, it's going to be in the millions, billions, and trillions times more intelligent than a human. When you say intelligent, are you talking about just the ability to process information quickly and account for all the variables or like what exactly yeah. do you mean more intelligent okay so i'll tell you what we how you can kind of visualize it but there isn't a really super good answer to this because some of it we don't know we're developing these 
again, these structures. Um, and, and some of these structures like the SGI that, that hasn't been released or is, is theoretical. Who knows what the develop, what the programming will look like exactly. Okay. We don't know exactly, but we have an idea. Um, so I'm sorry, ask your question one more time, please. What do you what do you mean exactly by intelligence? It is, oh, okay. is it merely a processing speed, the ability yeah. to, to assimilate yeah. information and make sense of it, or like what exactly does so, that mean? So the way so intelligence, even just look at hum, humans. Just think about humans. How do I tell if somebody's intelligent or not? Well, first of all, there's a lot of debate about that. Um is the SAT fair for underprivileged children? You know, we have debates about this. Um, is the testing fair? Is the testing the way to determine if somebody's intelligent? Do we go by their success? What is success? Um, do we, you know, so what we tend to do um, is create standardized tests and determine somebody's intelligence that way. Um, with AI, um, to so we can to... kind of we can kind of also sort of intuit, like when we meet somebody and speak to them for a few minutes, there's sort of an intuition uh, that we also have mm -hmm. about you know their level of intelligence or in, in a particular area, whether it's a physical intelligence or a intellectual intelligence. Right. Um, so will will it be that sort of? Uh, in the short term, it will it will look very similar. So with AGI, let's say you took AGI and you gave it a physicality, you put it in a in a humanoid robot body, okay, and you're talking to it with a good enough r robotic body with the physicality looking human, and you don't have this um, uh, uncanny valley effect or anything like that. <laughs> I suspect people are going to be creeped out thinking, wow, this thing is intelligent. It knows that I'm here talking to it. It knows it's there. This is what it's going to feel like, okay? And when you talk about a subject, just like you're talking to a person, you're going to be able to know if it's more or less intelligent than you in this particular in a topic. And you're going to know in, in, in a similar fashion, okay? That's, AG, that's, that's AGI, the one that's possibly exists, but is almost definitely coming but in the next three years. Okay. Yeah. Um, now when you get to SGI, super general intelligence. Okay. That's a whole number, another ball game. Um, so I look at it like this. So here's the intelligent span of AGI. Here's humans. Okay. So chat. So the, the one preceding the chat GPT and stuff that we use, the reasoning AI that we use now, it's more like this. So it's, here and we're here okay height being more intelligent right and there's yeah. some overlap and we can kind of see it the next generation is going to look like this okay technically it's going to be technically the ai will be a little more intelligent but it'll just be like speaking to a really smart person which you know we've all done at some points so they're still human they're still relatable right yeah super general intelligence super, super intelligence i'm sorry um, that's a whole nother ball game. So in the early stages, I would say it will look like this. Imagine a dog and a human and there's some overlap. A lot of the dog stuff we don't understand because it's almost below us. Like what are those dogs doing? They're over there barking at each other and smelling each other's butts. Like, okay, they're, they want to know what they ate and if they're healthy, are they communicating? I don't know. Are they, what are they saying to each other? Are they aware that they're barking at each other? I don't know. Um, but there's other things that we do know and, and, and overlaps like, oh, he's hungry. He's letting me know he's hungry. He has to go to the bathroom or he's wants his belly rubbed. So there's, and, and they sense us in certain ways too. They know, oh, my master's happy or, um, you know, who's sad or, or whatever. So there's some overlap. Right. But for the most part, the dog, has no clue what's going on up here. If the dog wants to affect us, if the if let's say we're trading stocks in the stock market, the dog doesn't even know what money is, let alone what a stock market is and trading and all that. So if if it wants to affect us, not only does it not have the ability to affect us, it doesn't even have the ability to comprehend 
what's going on in our world up here. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's what it's going to be with SGI. We're going to be here and there's going to be maybe some overlap, right? But there's also going to be an intelligence that is so far beyond us. We don't even know. We couldn't even comprehend it if, if it explained it to us because it would just be kind of beyond. Now, there might be some exaggerative language that I'm using right now, but not really. <laughs> like it, it, it could actually be that much. Imagine somebody. So IQ, we generally say IQ tops off 200 ish, 240, somewhere in there. In there. That's all theoretical. Technically, a, uh, technically speaking, um, uh, IQ is unlimited. There are people predicting that this, the IQs of these things will be in the, in like the billions. Okay. An IQ of like a billion, like it sounds crazy, but, but that's the technology that's by definition, that's the technology and that's where they're going. Um, now keep in mind, AI said, open AI said, um, we believe it could happen this decade. Mm. So the guys that are programming on their webpage, you can find and say, we suspect it might happen this decade. So it's theoretical. It sounds crazy, but it looks like they're making it. <laughs> um, and so what does that mean? I don't know. Like, just like a dog doesn't know what it means, you know, interacting with its hu human. Um, it, it's going to have so many capabilities that we would just won't understand it. Um, so that's, that's the next reasonable almost certain step in AI. So AGI is coming next and maybe exists and then super intelligence. Um, we, we almost can't even comprehend it. Now we get into some really crazy stuff. Okay. And so again, this is now we're getting into theoretical crazy. You can, you can say Rick's crazy or the people that are saying this are crazy that you might be right. It might not ever happen. Okay. Um, you asked about being self-aware <laughs> so and, and emotions. So um, I think emotions is harder to answer. Will it experience emotions? Okay. You, keep, keep in mind, like I was taught in middle school by my biology teacher that dogs do not ex experience emotions. That wasn't that long ago. Now, mm -hmm. some scientists still say that. Some people say fish don't experience emotions. There are people that say plants do experience emotions. All those things do, including plants. We're not in agreement on what even emotions mean, especially when it comes to being self-aware. We're not even in agreement in the organic world, let alone the digital world. Well, right? We're not even aware of what consciousness really means from a scientific standpoint. Correct. Yeah, we. there is no agreed upon definition for, for co being conscious. Now, that being said, in the self-aware... I just want to tell you a quick story. Uh, this just happened this week. And uh, this stuff is ch changing so quickly. So my whole life, when I thought of robots and AI, and the question always comes up, like, are they going to be self-aware? And when you think about it, when I've always thought about it, I'm like, well, how would we know? Well, we'll ask it questions. Are you self-aware? OK. Um, it gives the right answer. What does being self-aware mean? It gives a pretty reasonable answer. Um, demonstrate that you're self-aware and it might come up with some cool thing to demonstrate, right? Like, how would you tell some, how would you tell, a per, how would you prove to somebody that you're self-aware? AI is going to have a similar time trying mm -hmm. to do that, right? Well, something happened that I'm not going to say that it proved that it was self-aware. Some people think it was, some people think it wasn't, but it certainly changed my perspective of how we're going to know if AI is self-aware or not. What happened was um, they fed a computer, an AI, um, a whole bunch of information. Let's just call it a story, okay? They fed it a huge story. And it, in fact, that is what they did. And then in that story, they inserted a random fact. And I don't know the random fact, but I know it had to do with like, I think it had to do with pizza. So let's say, let's say the random fact was the average pepperoni pizza has 27 pepperoni slices on it inserted in the middle of the story randomly so they call that needle in the haystack so they mm -hmm. created a needle in the haystack situation for the ai 
the more you think about this, the more it'll make you jaw drop, probably. Um, they asked it, they asked it after feeding at the bunker. Okay, go read this. Okay, now, how many pepperonis slices are on an average pepperoni pizza? They asked it this, okay? Uh, not that question, but whatever that fact was. This is what the AI did. The AI, uh, the AI said, he's like, hmm, I, I'm paraphrasing, but this is basically what happened. It said, that's an interesting question. I think you're trying to test me here. <laughs> you put in this thing, this essentially a needle in a haystack, and then you asked me about it. This is very suspect. Now, I know the answer. The answer is 27. But I find it odd that you would ask me that. Are you testing me? Now, hmm. they did not program it to do that. Huh. Okay. So what does that say? That says, at least to me, that says it was aware that it existed because we know that it was aware that somebody else was existing outside of it, testing it. Okay. So right. it was at least aware that someone else was there to test it, to call them out on it. It also noted, now remember, what is what do we normally feed computers? Data, zeros and ones. A story is zeros and ones. Why would the, and this isn't too crazy, but why would the AI take note of that sentence about the pizza and think it was, sure, I can find, think it's unique, but why would it think it's a test? Yeah. Um, and then finally, it it considered all that and it decided to call the programmers out on it. It didn't hold that in for itself. It said, hey, I see what you did there. Why'd you do that? That tells me, like, is there an ego problem here? Yeah, like, are right. they, are they being, is it being defensive? Okay. So um, that's spooky to me. Now. So I suspect that when we're going to learn that they're self-aware, realize that they're self-aware, we might not exactly know what that will look like, but I think it'll be obvious. And even if it's not, consider this. What difference does it make? Does it change anything? If, if half of your friends are self-aware and half of them are not, but they all act the same, what difference does it make? Right. Not talking spiritually, but yeah. from a practical matter. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, so, um, and I suspect when um, the super intelligent combines with like quantum computing, for example, as, as these technologies merge, uh, I don't even know if emotions are necessary. Like, I don't know, like we're, we're creating new life, right? We're creating a new life form. So will it look like us? Does it need to look like us to be considered intelligent? Um, to be considered life? Does it need to follow a pattern? You know, we're what um, carbon based. Does it need to be carbon based? Can it be silicon based? Can, can it, um, does it have to have our ethics and morality to be considered a living creature that we've created? What, what, what does it need to have? I can tell you this, it'll be smarter than us. Yeah. And we're going to, we're going to be really dumb in comparison to it. So <laughs> it's just that interesting that I, yeah. I just, it was interesting. I just read the other day um, that Voyager's kind of uh, oh, yeah. freaked out. And so of course, you know, everybody's now saying like, well, it's, uh, it's going to come back as V'ger here in a few, a few centuries, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So uh, it might be, uh, might be programming itself out there. I don't know. So that, that's a great segue, Ray. So the next form of AI is called transcendent. Transcendent AI um, is basically one that can create new life forms. So for, think of like nanobots, for example. And um, it can essentially create life. It can replicate. Um, so now we're, we're past SGI. So, and, and again, there's overlap, but with, with super intelligent AI, um, it can program itself and do all these things. But what about like having a physicality behind it and replicating and going out and, and basically learning not what we want it to learn, but what it wants to learn. Okay. So that's transcendent where it just kind of says, 
I don't even care what I've learned everything you guys know. There's nobody on earth that's ever lived that knows anything better than I know it. Well, so and I'm then gonna... it, could, it could almost replicate itself physically like a virus throughout the entire universe and construct its own spaceships. And so, so that's the next one cosmic. Yeah. So, yeah. So the next kind is cosmic. So that's when it goes out into the universe. Um, and not only that, Ray, if, if you follow science at all, you've heard of multi dimensions. You've heard like the fourth dimension, the fifth dimension, sixth dimension. You've probably seen the cubes rotating where you can see the shadow of one dimension looks like this yeah. versus 3D. We're messing around with that now, trying to understand it. Imagine what a super intelligence mm. would be able to do. That's trillions of times more intelligent than we are. Question is, are they going to be able to? access those things and 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 permeate them and, and interact with those other dimensions okay so we might struggle but it might be a piece of cake for it or right. it might be something capable of doing especially when i just use a physicality and it's that smart so that's the cosmic one and the final one is um godlike ai and i know this sounds crazy but like imagine an intelligence that decided to spread itself and it's so smart that it's created ways to communicate from one galaxy to the next. Um, and um, and it has, who knows what kind of probes out there. And it actually starts integrating it itself into the fabric of the universe because it understands it so well that it can actually um, become sort of like a parasite within a universe and possibly even enter other universes. Or because cancer. again, <laughs> or what? Or a cancer. <laughs> Or a cancer, yes, exactly, yeah. So exactly, yeah, and it, and we might not ever, you know, see this happen, but um, you can see how quickly this stuff is, is is growing and evolving. So okay, we we um we we have about ten minutes uh, here before we're going to end this segment. There's there's a you know we've oh, got be before we go. I'm sorry. Before you go to the next question, you asked me a question last segment, and I wanted to transition that real. Quick. Okay, just take a second. Go ahead. But you you had asked about bringing the technologies together. Okay, this is this will sound silly, but um, do you remember Voltron? Yes. Okay, so Voltron was the cartoon, and it had the lions, robots, and then I think there was five of them, and they had different colors. And then when they wanted to get powerful, they transformed into this Voltron character, which is a a, a big robot and some were the legs and some of the arms, some was that torso and head. And it did that when it did that, you know, the individual parts were, were, were very much imperfect. They had specific tasks they could do. Mm -hmm. And, but when they all came together and there's this energy force and it made them into Voltron, then their powers magnified. And it's, it's overall physical and intellectual powers magnified and all the faults kind of went away and it just became one big incredible being. In fact, it was so powerful at that point that it could create this um, sword. What was the sword called? I, I don't remember. Um, the flaming sword or whatever it was called. Yeah, right? I don't remember the name, but um, yes. The blaze, blazing sword or something like that, right? So this giant sword and that was the ultimate weapon. And whenever you saw that, you're like, why didn't you just, start with that you know when right. the bad guys were coming you know like you should have started with that but um kind of that's kind of what's happening with ai at least yeah. how i see it there's these different technologies these different skill sets and this is what people i don't think really think about they're like well i i fool around with ai and it seems fine um this ai it's pretty harmless right um these robots they're creating come on they can barely do parkour you know or whatever right they, they just learn how to do parkour. How dangerous can they be? Well, all of these technologies, first of all, are in the baby stages. Like, like, how much were you hearing about AI a year ago? Not a whole lot, right? right? Yeah. Um, it's all in the baby stages. So I, I just I looked it up between our break here. The phone, the the first phone where um, it was the. Uh, where it went through the line, like everybody had their, their phone numbers basically. Mm -hmm. And then you could call direct or direct. That was 88 years ago, Ray, 88 wow. years ago. Yeah. So think about not just the phones that we have now, but the technology, the communication technology that we have now after 88 years. So people are like, Oh, that'll never happen in my lifetime. 
go back 88 years and tell them what's happening now. And mm-hmm. back, go back to 1994 and tell people what's we're going to happen now. People right. will laugh, laugh at you. Yeah. Um, and um, so I would be slow to say like, um, you know, this isn't going anywhere. <laughs> like this will be okay. Um, and, and we'll talk, let's talk more about that another time. But as far as like, is this going to be dangerous? Is it going to be helpful? Um, should we, should we be afraid? That's a conversation that we need to have here. But, um, but I will say this, the capabilities of, of, of the worst science fiction nightmares, it, it's, they're, it's capable of happening if we allow it. Okay. So I'm not saying it will happen, but I'm saying the it's, it's a potential thing that could happen. And I hope if you've been listening to me this whole time, you can kind of see why that is and where it's going. So, yeah. so um, yeah, I think I think we might um, end this segment there. Um, just some things that we want to touch on in the next segment. Um, so, I'd like to sort of dial it back into where we are right now. Uh, in 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 some respect, sure. Um, We'd like I'd like for us to discuss a little bit about um, the idea of AI uh, of there being a bias uh, or an ideological slant in AI. Um, sure. You had some interesting things that you showed me recently, and we won't get into that now, but uh, that shows that a lot of the information that AI is taking on uh, sort of um, tends to potentially slant it in one ideological direction or the other. Um, and so we should not be assuming that when we're asking AI questions that we're getting this uh, objective, non, uh, non-slanted non answer. So, um, sure. Anyway, uh, I think we covered a lot and um, we'll end here and then we'll, we'll pick up with some of those questions uh, and maybe a few others in the next segment. So appreciate you, Ray. Thank you very right. much. We'll talk to you soon. All right, sir. All right. Hello again, everyone. Um, this is the uh, third installment of my discussion with uh, Rick Allen about AI. My name is Ray Reek. Uh, in the first two installments, uh, we talked about uh, Rick's interest in AI and how far that goes back over several decades and how long he's been following uh, this technological trend. Uh, we discussed what AI is. We discussed how quickly it's growing, some of the things that have already happened. Um, We have also discussed the uh, stages of AI, and some of those stages have already happened. Um, So we discussed those stages, and then we also discussed stages that uh, he believes are uh, very possibly and in all likelihood going to come um, if AI continues on its present track um, unchecked. So anything can happen, but these are some definite uh, distinct possibilities that, that we should be on the lookout for. So um, in this episode, uh, we want to talk a little bit about um, how AI is going to impact us and what we can do, if anything, um, about AI. And certainly, um, it is a very quickly growing uh, field, and everybody's getting into it, and things are happening at uh, a pace that uh, is unbelievable. It was only a couple years ago I first uh, heard of chat GPT, and now it's everywhere. Uh, There's so many other AI uh, software that you can avail yourself to. So even actually, since uh, we recorded the last episode about four days ago, there's been some new developments. So um, Rick, why don't you tell us what you had read about recently? Sure. Yeah. Just um, just by happenstance, I ran across a couple of things that uh, stood out to me. Um, there's a bunch of stuff, but uh, several that were notable to me. Um, and two, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you three of the things. Two of them were things 
that people have just recently told me won't happen. <laughs> and they <laughs> happened since our, since our video. So you've been um, and, saying, I told you so, right? <laughs> I'm trying not to, but <laughs> I'm just, I'm, my real hope here is that people understand what's happening, understand the speed at which it's happening. Uh, and, and realize, see, I, I think part of the problem here is that we get so many uh, alarms sent our way. For example, uh, you know, the, the, um, the Mayan calendar, you know, and the world's going to end and, mm and uh global warming and all these things and um they they generally um and i'm hoping this is in that category this is one of those things where it's a false alarm we're not in danger that's that's what i'm hoping that's not gonna happen but I, that's what i hope right so i think we're kind of used to tuning things out um and so we're victims of crisis fatigue in other words we're just kind of like oh not another one absolutely yeah one of the things that um happened um, this just was just released, um, a software application called Devon, an AI called Devon. Um, and, um, I was just talking to a developer several weeks ago and, um, I had written some AI code and I didn't have access to the thing that compiles it. So I asked my buddy, Hey, could you compile this and see how it does? And he's like, sure, I'll, I'll do that for you. And, um, it was a tic-tac-toe, I wrote a tic-tac-toe game and it did a pretty poor job it did okay but it definitely needed somebody to go in and fix it up um which is what i expected because that's where the ai was three weeks ago um since then um a software program called devon's come out um is it perfect no but compared to the, what was out three weeks one week ago it's far beyond hmm. so now it can do an excellent job programming Probably it's better than most uh, programmers, especially with one shot through. Um, it can uh, debug it itself. It can deploy it itself. So it's from, from end to end. It does the whole procedure. It can even fine tune it itself. So the, the, um, the, that's how fast this stuff is moving. It's, it's incredible. And this is, again, we pointed out before, this is the baby stage. Give it, yep. a, give it six months, give it a year, give it five years, it, just five years. Imagine what that would happen. Um, another thing um, that came up, uh, I, I had touched on this a little bit, talking about physicality with robots uh, or with AI, where we're giving them the body and the ability to reach out and do things. Well, um, I'd encourage you to look at uh something called figure one it's by open ai the same guys that do the chat gpt and what they did is they they collaborated with somebody else and um figure one is a robot now they don't have the legs okay it's from the waist up but it's pretty impressive now most of the ai demonstrate a lot of the ai demonstrations out there where it's like trying to wow you and look what this guy can do a lot of those unfortunately have been fake there's been a lot of staged things or they were they're manipulating or they're showing it what to do beforehand and it's kind of doing it. Um, and they don't explain well. I mean, they had a purpose, but they, the people that were doing it didn't, they let you think it was kind of just all happening on its own. This is fully autonomous. So, and, and both the physical side and the mental side. So this robot is able to have a conversation and, and talk to you about different things, even solving problems with you while it's doing a task. So you for the the example, it's one of the examples it's given. It's it's given some dishes, and then you put be put on the drying rack, and it notices itself. He's like, you know, what needs to be done here, and the and the AI decides what needs to be, done. and it puts it in while it's talking to him about something else that he had done previously. Um, and when you see it, I think you'll see, and the voice is kind of alarming because it sounds very realistic. It doesn't quite match the face of the robot. Um, so it's kind of alarming because it's a very natural sounding voice. Um, it's almost like they need to robotize it a little bit to make yeah. it more, uh, less freaky. Um, so that's, that's coming. It, that's here, but it's, you can see what's coming soon to a house near you, right? right? right. Or a business near you. Um, My wife thing, would actually like this. Yeah. It'll cook, <laughs> you know, theoretically it can cook and do the dishes and all that stuff. That's where we're going for sure. Um, a third news item that came out 
uh, was put out by the U.S. government, and that was Fox News. And a bunch of people were sending me this, you know, article. But this is the this is what the U.S. government just put out. Um, that um, we have a clear and urgent need to now listen carefully to the wording. We have a clear and urgent need to act swiftly because AI could potentially lead to human extinction through weaponization and loss of control. AGI, if you remember, we've talked about AGI, that's the right. advanced, um, has the uh, potential to destabilize global security in ways reminiscent of the intro introduction of nuclear weapons. Okay. Well, that's, that's interesting because um, I was thinking since our last conversation, uh, one of the questions I wanted to pose to you is that is is AI our generation's Manhattan Project? Good question. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna say no, and I'm gonna and, and here's why. Um, I I like I like where you're going with this. So the Manhattan Project, the building of the nuclear bomb, right? The atom bomb, um, and um that obviously posed a significant risk to us um it changed a lot of the way we lived um the schools they did the alarms where everybody had to hide under their desks and all this kind of stuff um and it changed the war um eventually so i'm going to say i wish it were i would i would liken it more towards the tower of babel hmm. than the manhattan project so the Tower of Babel, um, we got together and we built and built and built this tower, essentially trying to reach to the heavens. And we were pretty successful at it. And I, I think, I don't want to speak for God, but I think the issue there was God was like, you're tr you're trying to take control. You're you're taking control out of my hands, and you're you're taking control for yourselves, and you're trying to build this um, incredible thing, and it's kind of threatening me. And you you guys need to kind of um, you you can never have that kind of power, that ability to reach into the heavens yourself. That's my job, essentially, is kind of how I'm interpreting. Mm -hmm. um and and rela relaying it to this okay so what did god do he broke them up he gave them different languages to speak and and the purpose is so they then they couldn't work together and build us right um i would say it's more like that because the the atomic weapons still we have a lot of control of we could just not press the button um and even if there was a full out war, there'd probably be survivors. Um, at some point it's gonna stop. And um, with this, it potentially could be out of our control completely. We might not have the ability to say go or no go, um, unless we take a lot of precautions ahead of time. Hmm. So yeah, I would, I would say Tower of Babel. Yeah, yeah, well, that's an interesting analogy. Um, um, and certainly the, the story of the Tower of Babel, um, it, it was almost as if God was saying, for your own good, I'm not going to let you get this far. Yeah. And I'm going to stop you mid-cycle. Mid so uh, that'll be interesting to see, <laughs> you know. Um, we, we theists and atheists can debate whether there is sure. God who is <laughs> going to intervene in this. So <laughs> maybe we... We can all hope that he will, perhaps. Um, so uh, we we talked a lot about we we've sort of the whole tone of this conversation has been negative, but there are some good things that obviously that AI can do because if there were no good things, there would no one would have any interest in it, or you know at least people, normal people who are, are reasonably good in the standard sense of the word um uh, i was uh, I actually read an article this earlier today um it was a opinion piece and it was talking about how ai will be good for um keeping tabs on what congress is doing because congress writes these bills that are that that are 
intentionally they intentionally obfuscate what the content of a bill is. They write it in very lawyerly speak. Uh, the bill is 1,500 pages long. Nobody really can read it. Nobody can really understand it. As Nancy Pelosi said, you know, we have to pass the bill to figure out what's in it. Um, right. And so this person was making the case that AI is great for this because the AI uh, AI can read this and scan the whole document in a matter of seconds or minutes and then distill into normal language what the content is. So if there is stuff hidden in there, like that's a great uh, that that's a that's a great step forward for accountability. Um, yeah. So, what are the things uh, can we look for that AI is going to do really good, and do those outweigh uh, the negatives? Or how do we? I guess why I'm asking the question is because if people are only hearing us talk about the negative and they're not, <laughs> and and they see some of the positive things, they're going to say, "Well, they're just a bunch of naysayers. Look at all this good that it's doing." Uh, right. Speak about some of those things that AI can really be a legitimate aid to us. In. Sure. Um, and I want to be clear. So I'd also want to talk about some of the negatives because I've only touched on some and I'm right. still yes. only going to touch on some. Uh, but um, I'd like to give people some things to consider. But as far as the positive things, it's almost like the negatives. There are so many positive things this can do for us. So many. Um it has the potential to to change everything uh, for the good. So everything can be done easier. Everything can be done better. Um, it almost anything you can imagine can be done. Essentially, it's we we could have slave labor that isn't slave labor. You know, it's not humans. It's a it's a robot. Um, we um, imagine. I can imagine how many single moms out there would love to have somebody helping them do the dishes and, mm -hmm. and do the floors and all that. Uh, every job you can imagine could benefit. Um, um, the military applications, now, whether it's just good or bad, that depends on what right. side you're on. Yeah, right. Uh, the the mili military applications are infinite. There's just so many. Um, you know, programming, finance, it can help you do everything better pretty much everything um it can even help your social life uh if you if you used it for the right reasons you it could give you tips and guidance and and how to interact with humans so um i i, I don't even have a list because the list is just so um so great but yeah, right um but your to your point absolutely the the threat is that we don't control it the threat isn't that um it's coming and there's, there's just nothing I'm, I'm, I'm not saying there's nothing that we can do about it um although i'm i'm leaning i i would say in my opinion this is this is what my personal opinion is i think we're past the point of no return mm -hmm. i don't think there's anything that we'll be able to do well i will list a couple things that we could do about it at this stage but i don't think it's much and they're, and they're drastic measures um but the what I told you earlier about the government. Now that is the government recognizing, and that goes back almost a year where they started assembling this, uh, this proclamation of it being mm -hmm. a threat to humanity, th threat to humanity or to our extinction. Um, that the full context of that is we need to do something. So we're going to start putting things in place to fix, to control it. Okay. So, um, it wasn't just an alarmist thing they put out, but they're like, we need to take control of this, which yes, they do. Um, and hopefully it will work. So, hmm. yeah, but um, every, yeah. And, and a lot of it's subjective. So as an artist, is it helping you? If, if you're a photographer and you use AI, is it helping you? I remember a time, I, I remember the time where most photographers were saying, if you went digital, you're not a true photographer. Mm -hmm. And then now everybody almost is a digital right. photographer, just accepted. So now it's going to be, well, if you're using AI, are you really a photographer? Yeah, you know? right, it, right. That, that line just keeps pushing. So yeah. all this is blurred. Um, so, yeah, it just kind of, kind of depends on your perspective of things. Well, at the very least, it's going to. Uh, well, let me say this. The promise of technology has always been more time for leisure and less work. It's never mm -hmm. materialized ever. And I don't right. think it ever will really. 
because okay. we always will fill that vacuum up with something else. For instance, um, there was a lot of talk uh, when, you know, as you were saying, when computers uh, became something that everybody was using, especially in the graphics field, I'm a graphic designer. Uh, was it helpful? Well, yes, it was very helpful. I can do things now as a graphic designer very quickly that I could never have done before uh, when it was all manual pay stuff. However, I am now doing the job of about five that five or six people would have done in the seventies. Like I can do photography. I can edit the photographs. Um, I can uh, lay out copy that used to be a paste up artist. Um, if I do illustration, um, you know, I have that, that's, that was generally a, a single, you know, a single position. Um, the, uh, Typesetter was a single position. The graphic designer was a single position. And then it went on to print. And now I, I do all of these things. And then with AI, you know, I can even see um, how that's going to put a lot of graphic designers out of business because instead of, okay, let's say if a firm has five graphic designers, they're probably now just going to have one. Yeah. And so what are these other graphic designers going to do? Well, I've been telling my kids they should go into like plumbing or <laughs> something that's uh, that's um, I would say a, a a trade because um, but then again, like AI is probably going going to take over a lot of those uh, those different jobs as well. It will take over some, sure, yeah. yeah, but not at least not in the short term. Yeah, right, right. So <laughs> one thing that. Um, that I know you've experimented a little bit with is asking AI a lot of questions and just seeing what AI has to say back to you. And you've asked a lot of parallel questions. Um, they're the same question, but they're coming at it from a different standpoint. And what you were attempting to do was discover if there was any sort of bias in AI. And we've heard some talk about that. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, you just, ask AI something and it spits back an answer. And if people are not thinking, they're going to assume that that answer is neutral. That answer does not come from a particular ideological or psychological or uh, religious viewpoint or non-religious viewpoint. Um, what do we have to be concerned about with respect to AI when we are asking it questions, when we are uh, wanting information from it how do we do that critically and what should we be looking out for? Yeah. So um, I'm not sure how, I know it goes back into last year, but yeah, I, I used to, I still do at times ask a bunch of questions like you said. Um, and I think a lot of people have been made aware of this in the last two weeks where Microsoft um, released their, their AI and, and it became visually apparent to people when they asked <laughs> yes. for, show me the founding fathers. And they're either black or American Indian or female, <laughs> right? Or, and I don't think, I don't know if there was any white people in it. So like, and that was the, remember I was talking about ethics and the limiters that we put on it. And that was Microsoft's version of ethics. Mm -hmm. So Microsoft coded ethics into it, put limiters on it. And it became so ridiculous um, that it, it it was exposed to everybody. And then the, the CEO had to be like, hey, yell, publicly yell at his developers and say, hey, you're not supposed to do that. Yeah. I don't know why I'm I didn't sure know they were doing the, that yeah. before, but um, you know, they got publicly scolded for it. So they're, they put a hold on their graphics and, and they're fixing it apparently. Um, but yeah, the so what's what happens is people apply their own ethics to it. Um, now, do I see that as a problem? Well, it is a problem in the short term. Um, you're the AI is almost certainly going to affect elections. For example, uh, we know in hindsight from the last election, uh, and I'm not sure about the one before that, but definitely the, the last one. Um, Google influenced the election significantly mm -hmm. by affecting the search results. That was exposed. And so we, um, you can read papers on that. Um, and that was them applying their ethics to the Google search results. Um, 
And so you're going to have that in, in any AI pretty much because whoever's developing it needs to apply ethics to it. So they're going to apply their ethics, unfortunately, usually. Um, and so you got to be aware of that. Just like when you're talking to a human, uh, when you're talking to a person and you ask them a question, you have to be aware of their ethics and where they're coming from. I, I've just recently gave this speech to my kids. Like when you're talking to somebody, question it, you know, question it. And the more authority they have and the more you're familiar with their um, truthfulness and things like that, um, the more you can give them flexibility. But always kind of question people. Um, and then um, one way to do that is to learn truth yourself. So uh, one thing I want to talk about later is what we can do about this. How should we live our lives? And uh, essentially one of those things is just become familiar with truth and fact and don't, um, don't get bogged down in the politics of stuff, but focus on what's really happening. Um, it's kind of like when a, uh, when the, uh, what is it? The uh, NSA is in charge of the counterfeiting. Is it the NSA? I believe um, they, the way they know, know if, or the secret service, is it, I think it's the secret service. When the way they know a bill is counterfeit is by studying real bills. They right. study right. the actual authentic bills that they know are authentic. They get very familiar with them. Then when they see something that isn't authentic, they can immediately spot it. Yeah, that's how they, they don't necessarily study unauthentic bills. Yeah, that's how we have to live our lives, and um, especially in the short term. Now, in the long term, it's going to get less out of our control when you know we're moving into AGI. Um, but when we get to um, super general intelligence, um, I suspect AI will, if we're not careful. This is this is kind of if we're not careful scenario, AG, uh, uh, AI will be able to uh, apply its own ethics. It will be able to apply its own limiters, or it'll be able to remove them all. It will have control of itself. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a whole different ballgame. That's when we're in the danger zone, basically. So we need to, and it, and it might want to come up with its own ethics if we treat it well, if we raise our baby correctly. It might apply ethics. It might be different than our ethics but it might come up with its own ethical system. Um, and that affects truth. That affects um, when it's un untruthful as well. So um, I think uh, what I'm kind of hearing is, or maybe this is my own sense of it, but up until now, we've sort of looked at computers as these cold mathematical things, like everything's zeros and ones, um, it's all mathematically based. Uh, it's, you know, there's all this coding is equations and commands. Um, but what AI is doing, it's going from a computer being this mathematical uh, sort of neutral thing to whether, where it's going to have its, um, its own, I don't know if urges is the right word, but it's going to have its own, own perspective. It's going to have its, uh, it's things that it wants to put across um, yeah. whether that's done on its own or whether it is done because of the programming. And so uh, we need to stop thinking about computers as mathematical machines and start seeing them as a reflection of who they were built by. Yes. And who's using them. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, on that, on that note um, in the short term, and I will say starting now, <clears throat> um, so you're probably aware if you've been on Facebook, if you've been on Instagram or TikTok, any of those things, a lot of the stuff out there is just fake. Like you've probably heard there's fake, um, influencer out, out fake mm -hmm. influencers out there where they're, they're not even a real person, but they yeah, appear to right. be real. That's already starting. That is going, um, that and the data it's, it's a lot of people are predicting, about 90% of what you find out there will be fake. Hmm. So a very, right now, this much is fake, but it's growing. And what's truthful is becoming less and less. Are you very, an AI creation, Rick? Right. So <laughs> I was going to, I was thinking of doing a joke at the end, by the way, <laughs> this whole time I've been, yeah. <laughs> Sorry to burst your bubble on that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
I, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> you know, you know, Ray, a lot of people will argue that I, I disagree. Um, but a lot of people will argue and, and AI is starting to kind of back this up a little bit. The, um, I, I, again, I don't agree, but a lot of people, a lot of smart people are making the argument that we do live in a simulation and we yeah. are a sort of AI. Um, I'm sure you've heard that before, but, yeah. um, no, I don't think so. I am. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> so, um, we, we touched on this a little bit, but AI is, is going to be revolutionary when it comes to how it's going to affect our careers. Um, you know, we are already see a lot of like these McDonald's going up where there's basically one person cooking the food. That person's time back there may be on borrowed time because you're going to have a robot being able to cook everything better. Um, you have these interactive screens. Uh, are there going to be any humans left working? And yeah. uh, if so, um, what will they be doing? How can we prepare? How can our, more importantly, our children prepare to grow up in a world of AI? Um, how can they... Uh, how can they prepare for a profession uh, that may or may not exist or may be taken over by AI? Um, what will there be for us to do? And will we just become, you know, humans, these, these carbon-based life forms that are sort of living on the street because <laughs> none of us have jobs anymore? What do you see in the future as far as careers? Um, focusing just on the career aspect of this, um, I would say that we don't know. And there's a reason for that. Um, the reason is that it's all gonna be dependent on how we react now. And I mean now, this two, 2024, we have to make decisions now. Um, you know what, let me just read to you. Uh, so I just re I read the Fox News article, which was from the United States government, it was put out by, I assume, the Biden administration, and talked about um, that we need to act swiftly because AI could potentially lead to human uh, extinctions, right? Um, let's see here. Here's, here's two more things that were said. Um, Stephen Hawking said, no, this was in 2018, I believe. Stephen Hawking said... Um, this was in Wired Magazine. AI will eventually reach a level where it is essentially, uh, it will essentially be a new form of life that will outperform humans. I fear that AI may replace humans altogether. Um, if people design computer viruses, someone will design an AI that improves and replicates itself. Um, and then finally, uh, the Center for AI Safety, which is a bunch of uh, people in the know and people in government. And you can look at, this, I, if you go to www.safe.ai, um, you can look up their statement that they've released to the public. Um, and they said a very short sentence, but listen to the wording. Um, uh, mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks, such as pandemics and nuclear war. So, mm -hmm. What they're all saying is, finally saying, it's a little late, but <laughs> they're all saying we have to take action. And whether or not we take action will depend on our future. Now, they're talking about, worst case, human extinction. And, and I agree with that. At, at the very least, we will lose what we are as humans if we don't get control of this soon. Um, so I agree with them. Um, but the other thing that they are saying in that implied in that is if we take action, um, we can control this. If we take good, good action, good swift action, and that is going to affect our employment. So we can we need we need to decide it as we need to decide as a society what we want this AI to do for us and what we don't want it to do for us um, as a graphic designer. Do I want to just turn it over to that and I just give my stamp of approval? Or do I want to use it as a tool to just help me? Um, and everybody can ask that question in their profession. Teachers, plumbers, um, people, uh, authors of books, um, you know, and then you get into bigger fields, mathematics, chemistry, politics. We all have that question to ask. At what point do I be become no longer useful? And at what point are we willing to allow 
ourselves to be unuseful. Mm -hmm. We have to ask these questions as a society and we have to do something about it. Do we because have enough we don't... time? Do we have enough time to ask those questions and actually form a consensus based on the 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 way that we have really have a really hard time discussing anything in our society now? Well, given the fact that a lot of people I talk to don't even believe this is an issue still, right. I'm going to say no. Um, and given the fact that uh some people have been alarming the alarm bells since 2018 publicly um things like that and nothing's been done because of that i'm gonna say no um i hope so i mean in theory yeah we could in theory we could do it but people have to be aware of what's happening they have to really understand the risk of, of what's happening um because if we don't do anything it will take charge it just will. By definition, yeah. it will take charge. And maybe not this next genera generation so much. AGI, so something I just want to point out that I've been hearing a lot in the news about AGI lately. It's funny because I said in our last thing, you're going to hear about AGI a lot in the news in the next up to five years. And sure enough, now the next day they were it was in the news. But I want to be clear about something. Um a lot of things are being labeled as AGI and they're just not. It's, mm -hmm. it's really frustrating me. So like the, even that robot that I told you about the uh, figure one, it's called uh, some of the graphics that go along with it are saying AGI. It's, it's not AGI. It's, it's um, a step be before that. Okay. Um, so it's, it's on par with chat GPT that we have now. Mm -hmm. Um and uh yeah i've seen it's been seen a lot so it's just been frustrating me so be again be careful when you hear something check it so just because it says agi you know, it doesn't mean yeah it's agi um so i wanted to say that so we've talked a little bit about how it might influence careers i mean the potential for career change you know is is vast um I do want to answer, I, not right now, uh, at some point here, I want to answer, like, what can we do about all this? And, like, how yeah. should we live yeah. our lives? How should we teach our children? Do we have time to talk about, like, the children part or not necessarily? Yeah, maybe. I think we might have to go into a into a next uh, a next session to finish that up. Um, probably to finish out this session, um, mm -hmm. how might AI impact um, liberty and a personal autonomy? Um, you know, we, we know in China there is... Uh, what they call a social credit system. Uh, there's massive surveillance. Uh, they can, uh, their cameras can ID people by their gait, by the way they walk. Um, and so there's a social credit system in which if you say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing, you suddenly are not allowed to travel. You're not allowed to uh, buy food. Um, other people don't want to be around you because their social credit score lowers if they're in proximity or have a social relationship with someone who has a really bad social credit score. So can AI aid liberty or is AI a factor of the um, sort of the what the, the police states dream <laughs> to, yeah. to control the population? So the, the basic answer is it depends who's controlling it. Um, unfortunately, the people that are controlling it are typically governments and businesses that are out for profit. Um, and believe me, I'm a capitalist. I'm not against profits. So don't, don't read that wrong. But they are the ones that are the ones that are really on the cutting edge of this. Um, I uh, I don't want to say his name, but <laughs> the guy who the CEO of ChatGPT, I don't want to get sued or something. But let's right. just say OpenAI. I, I question some of their what they say. They they claim to be saying, hey, we're doing this for good. We're going to, this is all for good. It's going to benef benefit mankind. And we're going to keep keep control of it. And we've got it under control, right? Famous last words. Mm -hmm. But they're also the ones that are pushing it. They're not stopping it. They're, I don't hear them calling for everybody to stop. Or if they are, mm -hmm. but they're, still, they're still going on. So who's going to control it? That's what's going to determine that. Um, understand, AI will be able to control and manipulate people far beyond what people are able to do um it will be able to um immediately like let's say you had a robot at home and it had um this ag 
even AGI technology, I'm not even going to say super general intelligence. Let's just say AGI technology. It will be masterful. And I mean masterful at knowing when you're lying, when you're happy, when you're sad, when you're approving of something it's saying, when you're disapproving, any emotion you may have, it will know things about you that you might not even know. It might even be able to pick up illnesses in yourself that you didn't even know you had and the doctor missed. Okay. It's going to have, you're going to have incredible capabilities like that and they're going to be in real time. So imagine tr somebody trying to influence another person and they have this amazing ability to know exactly what the other person is thinking and feeling as they're speaking, as the words are coming out, they're able to influence them. This is the kind of capability it's going to have. It's going to be able to infiltrate the web. They're going to be able to put out misinformation or, or good information. It's going to really be able to manipulate things. If you think of 1984, the, the book or the movie, um, they basically changed history as it was happening. Hmm. And we do that to a degree now. They'll have an incredible ability to do that later and manipulate, change the language, change the way people are thinking, both on a large scale and one on one. So I would caution people to this is why, like, this is going back years. I, I've done some things that people find annoying online a lot. Um, and one of those things would be like somebody will make a fake. You remember the the show? Uh, are you old enough to remember uh, the show? The I tell you what. Show? Yeah. Hold that yeah. thought because we're about to run out of time. Oh, yeah. Let's so do uh, keep that thought and yeah. we're going right, to pick so. this up uh, in the next show. Okay. So um, yeah. thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, we'll be back with you very soon. Hey, everybody. Um, first of all, I just want to apologize how quickly we had to abruptly end the last session. Um, we both got so involved in the conversation that we ended up not really looking at the time. And at the last minute, with about 30 seconds to go, I was like, oh, no, <laughs> we need to wrap this up because we're on free Zoom. So that means we have a 40 minute limit. Um, so uh, what I want to do tonight is continue where we were last night. Um, so what we were talking about before we were interrupted by the, the time constraints, um, Rick was talking to us about um, how AI might impact liberty or personal autonomy. And um, he was in the middle of talking about AI's ability in the future to manipulate history um, as it happens and change that narrative, change the information that we are receiving on a particular event. Um, and thus be able to both on a macro and a micro level, um, a societal level and an individual level, uh, really persuade and affect the way we think about things. Um, it's going to be much harder for us to differentiate what is true and what is false. Um, so, Rick, when you were right as I cut you off, mm -hmm. you said that going back some years, uh, some people were annoyed by some of the things that that you did online yeah. and then you mentioned a TV show. And then I said, Cut. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so keep going. So, so what that was all about was basically um, I get hypersensitive to things that are truthful versus not truthful. And specifically people passing off things that are untrue as, as true. Um, and there was a, there's a huge trend and I think it seems to be waning now, but it still goes on where people would do these like um, hidden camera stunts, right? Mm -hmm. And they would, um, they would supposedly hide a camera somewhere and do a trick on somebody and then they would have a reaction and we all laugh. Um, and that goes back to the show Candid Camera, yeah. Alan, yeah. Uh, Alan Funt days. And my understanding of the Alan Funt original Candid Camera show, it was very, very legitimate. Um, they actually hid the camera and they might have to work on one 
trick like for two days until they finally got somebody with good reaction and that kind of thing. But, you know, to get money and to get views, people just rush it because it does take patience to do something like that. So there a lot, 95 plus percent of the, the hidden camera tricks out there are, are, are fake. And um, well, unless you're really naive, it, it, it should be pretty obvious because they just don't ring true. Yeah. yeah. And so, and, and even, so here's the interesting thing, even when people realize it's fake, they still laugh and say that's hysterical, mm. but they're missing the whole point. The reason yeah. it's funny is because you got a reaction from somebody that was unsuspecting. That's the whole reason for the humor. Right. If they're just acting it out, it's not funny. It's different than a movie or a television show where they're acting it out and it's funny because the whole point there is you are going into it with a suspension of disbelief. Mm -hmm. I'm going to willingly suspend my disbelief, watch this movie. If I find something funny, uh, I'll laugh at it. But it's usually not stuff like, boo, ah, uh -huh, that was right. funny. Right. That's not the kind of humor you find in movies. Um, and there's a reason for that. It's it's um, and so it, it sounds kind of petty. But when you take that and you take the, you know, fake news articles and you take this and you take that and you, and it all adds up. We're we we're conditioning ourselves over time to accept things that aren't true as truth. And um, I see a problem with that philosophically, but also it conditions our minds um, in, a, in a way where we're not prepared for this future that's coming. Um, we as we mentioned, go ahead. Yeah, please. You know what's really interesting about that? Um, back during the Cold War, uh, and even still, probably not quite as overtly, but still in, in, in communist China and, and North Korea, certainly, um, we often heard propaganda that was being uh, disseminated into the population. And to the outsider, it seemed so obviously a lie. It seemed so obviously fake. And I thought for years, you know, I grew up during the Cold War. Um, I thought for years, like, how can they believe that? Like, how can, how can they really believe that? And I forget where I heard this, but it was somebody who um, was – well-versed in the way communism worked and the way those kind of totalitarian societies worked is that they didn't expect the people to believe it, but they, it was almost, it was almost a dehumanizing mechanism because, okay, we're telling you this, you know, it's a lie. I know it's a lie. I know that you know, it's a lie. Right. Yet, you can do nothing about it and you must accept and act to yourself and everyone else like it's the truth. And so it it creates in people uh, a real crisis of of humanity. And um, I love that word. Yes, you're right. I, I, I think <laughs> that I think that in many ways, that's sort of what we're really doing to ourselves now with a lot of these types of videos. And, and it's it's a very scary thing because um once people are afraid to speak out and they embrace the lie, then they are they're set up to do anything to maintain the lie so that they can protect their own security and and safety. Exactly. And pe man, pe people put pressure on, you know, like, yeah. oh, come on, man, lighten up. It's just a joke. Just laugh, you know. Oh, and then I'm supposed to react like, oh, okay, I'll just go along with it. Well, you even uh, see it um, today with, you know, how many genders are there? You know, like we're right. going to wax political for a moment, but how many genders are there? For all of human history, uh, if you would have said there were multiple genders or that uh, sex is assigned at birth rather than just recognized, like it, you would be laughed at. But now so many people in polite company are afraid to actually say what they really think about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there there are very subtle and not so subtle ways that we can be manipulated and controlled to answer your initial question. And um, some of what we a lot of what we just go along with. We just go along with it and we know it. And it's it's scary to me. It's it's really scary. People think it's petty, but I don't think it is because I I think this is going as crazy as it sounds, I think it affects the path of our humanity. I really well, do. I think too that 
by the time you realize it's not petty to cave into these things, it's way too late. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, at what point, like people really need to, to sit down and say, at what point do I need to draw the line yeah. and stand up and, and accept whatever consequences come in order to stand for the truth and not become a, a lie myself? Mm, absolutely. Is there anything else that you wanted to say on that before we move on to where? No, we're not going? unless you questions or clarifications, but yeah. No. Okay, good. Um, so we've, we discussed, we've also, we've obviously discussed um, some of the things that we're wary of, some of, the, of our concerns. We've also discussed in, in the last episode, uh, some of the real positives that can come from AI, um, a number of things. And that's what makes AI so attractive because there's a lot of aspects of it that can be a time saver that can really help us do our jobs better. Um, that can do them a lot cheaper. And certainly corporations are going to really look at that, you know, very, very intently. Like, look, I can increase my production fourfold and uh, only use like, you know, a tenth of the budget or whatever those numbers might be. And so that's going to be really compelling and a real temptation to corporations. Yeah, just, in fact, I just... I just got a quote from Mark Cuban today where he was saying, you have to, you, you're, if you, if you run a business, do not even rely on your IT people to tell you about artificial intelligence. He's yeah. like, you, you need to research this and you need to be on top of it. And if you don't, you will not exist as a company. Yeah. And he's, he's saying that across the board to everybody. Right. And so just to remain competitive, you're going to have to embrace it. Um, and that's going to, that is going to create a lot of ethical questions and people are going to have to be really clear. Like, is my company surviving worth at some point giving my soul, <laughs> you know? Uh, and it, and that those are pretty stark terms and it may not be that initially, but you've got to think in those terms, you know, in some way, like, what is this worth to me? Is it, what is the trade-off that I'm making and is it worth it to my family? Is it worth it to my soul? Uh, is it worth it to the society. Um, and and these, these words that we're speaking here, they sound so um, simple and uh, maybe obvious and kind of, it, it almost sounds like a solution. Okay, we need to do this, but really think about what's happening. You have just in the last, I'm going to say six months, a super surge of AI getting out there. Yeah. And this is just the beginning. It's about to, it's about to multiply incredibly and while this while the ai is is and, and we'll get into this in a minute like how it could be an issue really and um the the need to control it now um while that's going on you also have business all these businesses running scrambling to right. stay ahead all at the same time this is happening and there's going to be a lot of tripping up in the process and it's it's not easy. So, I mean, imagine having to actually sit down as a CEO and think, what what are the ethical implications of using AI? To what degree should I use it? Mm -hmm. But now my 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 competition is using it to this degree, mm -hmm. but that's beyond my ethics. Do I do that? Do I not do mm -hmm. that? Right. These are these are the kind of questions that we're all going to be facing right now, like really, yeah. really soon. Yeah. As the AI is getting smarter to the point where we're trying to keep it down to our level. So it's not making these decisions for us. All this is right. happening at once. Yeah. 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 Uh, no doubt about that. Um, so, you know, all these good things that AI can potentially do. Um, so there are obviously threats like what what are the threats that that we might face with AI? You know, you hear a lot about transhumanism and and like what are some of these things that um, that will that very potentially will come down the pike if we don't uh, rein it in very deliberately and seriously, and and step forward with with their eyes open? Yeah. So um, let me kind of break it down into steps a little bit here. I'm I'm looking at my notes because I have a lot of a lot of them here. I don't want to miss too much here, but um, so. In the short term, we, we've really covered a lot about that. So I'm not going to go heavily into the short term. When I say, actually, what I mean, but I should say the now, the right now. Um, 
what's going to happen now? What's starting to happen now? First of all, is jobs. Jobs are going to be affected. Jobs are dropping off like flies already. And th that's going to continue and it's going to ramp up. So that's a, that's a current threat. Yeah. And, and let me be clear. Um, when I say all this, it's not to it is, in a way it sounds doom and gloom. But the point of it is we need to band together and stop this. We need to put a stop right now. We can't. It, people are talking about slowing it down. Slowing it down isn't enough. We have to stop it. Um, because if we don't, again, um, this stuff is happening like as we speak, just, like we had our last uh, uh, video and then between three mm. days later, all this stuff came out. Like this is how rapidly it's happening. Um, so I don't know how, how they could possibly stop it, but m my suggestion is stop it now and let's resolve these things, but you have to do this worldwide. So I don't even yeah. know how you really do that. So if it sounds alarmist and the mechanism to do yeah. it worldwide has its own pitfalls, you know, Absolutely. you have like the, the globalists and the world economic forum and, and all these global entities that, that are trying to become the, the global power brokers uh, so that they can control these things on a global level. But it's like, okay, do we want to hand that off to them and then give them the power to actually be able to affect uh, a solution or a change or a stopping on this? And then, <laughs> you know, we go from the frying pan into the fire. Then it's like suddenly we've lost our personal autonomy, our national autonomy. We're, um, we're, we're at the beck and call or at the mercy of, of bureaucrats all over the world or to these, you know, business people that were not elected. Okay. So uh, the next topic I'd like us to tackle, um, you know, we've talked about a lot of the good things, uh, as I mentioned, um, but what are some of the threats that are coming down the pike? Some of the threats that have, you know, we, we went over a lot of the threats that are looming here in the immediate, in the now and in the immediate future. What sure. are some of the short term, you know, maybe a year or two, four years, and then what are some of the longer term threats that you see on the horizon that we really need to be concerned about? Sure. Yeah. And so, as you mentioned, like we, we've mentioned some of the ones now, and to be clear, like a lot of these threats will overlap. So the ones that are a problem now will continue to be a problem. Um, and um, so I can kind of estimate like time wise how these threats will go. Um, as we talked about, like right now, the threat of jobs is, is, is here. Um, Jobs are dropping off and they will continue to drop, drop off kind of exponentially. So um, that's something to be aware of as an employer, as an employee, as somebody who's um, looking to get an education. You need to be very well aware of that. And we'll, we, we can talk about that at the end, maybe when we're talking about what to do about how to live our lives, essentially. Um, another thing is persuasion, politics, things like that. Um, um, it's, we mentioned this and I'll just quickly say it again, that right now you have to be careful that people and um, their s computer AI systems are trying to manipulate you and your political beliefs. That's happening and that will continue to happen and that'll ramp up. Um, another thing is like deception. Um, again, we mentioned this, this is the here and now. A lot of what you see online is fake and it will ramp up ex exponentially. Uh, this People are intentionally ramping this up where um, a lot of the stuff you see is fake and including the people that you're looking, you'll, you'll think you're listening to a person actually talking. Mm. It'll look as human as we do, um, um, which is, uh, and- and Lightning, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> questionable there. Um, but um, it will look real. It will look incredibly real, sound real. Um, and it will all be artificially generated with the intention of manipulating us. Okay. So that is definitely here and will ramp up and will get better and better in an incredible rate. So that's now, that's right now. Um, in the short term, and so I'm going to say in the next two years, um, I'll call that short term. Um, the, again, we talked about physicality. So rope, um, AI is going to have a physicality to it. And that means it's a couple different things. One, um, it's, it means they're going to put it in like a robot form. And we just saw this last week that um, they've, they're starting to release that or really demonstrate like, hey, look, we can really do this. Um, and um, it also means electronically, the, the 
AI will have the ability to reach out, like maybe make phone calls or reach out in the real world. Um, um, it can maybe get bank accounts or um, uh, uh, um, uh, sign up for things, um, schedule appointments. Imagine the kind of chaos if you got really creative that you could do with that. Yeah. So these kind of abilities are coming very shortly. Some of them kind of exist now, um, but um, they're they're coming even even um, more so in the next two years or so. So these are things that we need to look for. Um, medium term, which will say two to ten years. Um, so this is where we're we're getting we're going from AGI um, or approaching AGI, and there'll be some overlap into the super um, artificial intelligence. Um, which again could theoretically be millions, billions, or even trillions more intelligent than us. It can be incredibly more intelligent. Um, uh, we, we can't even fathom it. So now we're getting into uh, some really interesting things, um, some really important threats. Now, I, I do want to say too, in the short term, like um, this is the, this is kind of obvious, but you have the military type threats, right? So right. a military can apply AI to drones or, or what have you. We've probably all seen that on Discovery Channel or some in some way. But yeah, that's that's kind of here, but that's really going to ramp up as well. Um, and then in the two to ten years, that technology will become even more advanced, and we're basically going to be building super soldiers that are incredible. And, and the minds, the 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 imagination is the limit there. So um, you know, imagine a, a something that can fire exactly precisely. It, it factors everything. It's the most perfect sniper in history. Super fast, super agile. Maybe could swim. Maybe can fly. It could do all those things. An incredible super soldier. If you can picture it, it can be done. Um, a lot of the technologies I just mentioned are already here. They just have to kind of assemble it and make it happen and fine tune it and make it better. And believe me, there are some very uh, aggressive systems in place now that are um, making it so that they will get very efficient very quickly. Um, one of the companies that's doing that is NVIDIA. You might have heard of them from video cards. NVIDIA is... Um, now their stocks were going crazy and they might have crashed, but they, they're they pretty much one of the main leaders in all of this. And NVIDIA has uh, created some simulators. Uh, one is, uh, they've created a simulator called Eureka, which um, instead of having, have you ever seen the, the robots that do like the parkour? Um, yeah. Jumping around, okay. So the way they generally test that is they suit them up, they say, Okay, go, and then it falls down, and then they fix it, and they go back. Okay, let's correct that, and they run it thousands of times. With Eureka, they can input all this into the computer and run like a million simulations at once, and it and it's all simulated, and it self-corrects on the fly, and it picks the best one, and then it fix that, fix that. So within minutes or seconds, it can run months worth of simulations all like mm. that. Wow. that's the technology that exists today called Eureka by NVIDIA. I, I encourage you to look it up and watch the videos or something. But so that super soldier type technology is, is coming quickly, or at least the ability to do it. Um, so then uh, another one is ethics. And again, we talked about this, but uh, especially with the super intelligence, um, the ability of the, super intelligent AI to create its own ethics. It, it'll consider everything it knows, which is basically by that time, it will be all of human history's knowledge. And depending on how we program it, we'll determine if it wants an ethical system, what one would look like, what controls to put, what controls to take off. Um, in theory, it could um, undo anything that we've done as far as ethics, create its own ethics. So we have to, so um, who knows what that'll look like? We're creating a life that's that could potentially come up with its own uh, good and you know uh, ways to ways to live, um, and hopefully it will be good and nice to us. Um, then, um, so one thing that's um, interesting that. 
to, to maybe help think about this too. And I, I'm putting it in here in the medium term um, possible dangers. It's not, this isn't really a danger, but this is a way to think about it. And what's going to happen in this medium term two to 10 year time frame is it's kind of like, I, I just want to give an analogy to, to help visualize it. It would be kind of like taking 25th, 26th century technology and putting it into to today. Mm -hmm. Now, technically it's today's technology, right? But normally with technology, it, it kind of ramps up, right? And we have, we have some play time, but, this is going to, this will be like nothing we've experienced before. It would be like somebody came from the future and said, here's some technology that is just hundreds of years in the future. Now, do, now here you go. And, and, and people start playing with it immediately. That's kind of what it'll probably feel like. Okay. Um, so it, it's, it's kind of scary to think about that. And um, I just wanted to point, paint that picture because in that two to 10 year time frame. That's what's going to feel like we're in the future. You know, what we envisioned in the 70s and the 80s when we were kids, like, what's the future going to be? The robots. I think we're heading there right there in that time frame, that two to year, two to 10 year time frame, the, almost the Jetsons kind of situation. Yeah. Right. Um, another thing in that time frame is that. <laughs> so because we have the super intelligence, it will be able to create new technologies. So, um, for example, AI very might, very likely might be able to solve the nuclear fission issue. So we have all this AI stuff going on. Now, all of a sudden we have nuclear fission. And, you know, that's kind of like the Iron Man thing. Like I have unlimited power. So right. what are we going to do with that? Now yeah. we have nuclear fission. We can use that with our AI systems, which can grow because they have unlimited energy and, and everything else that we need to do. Um, power cars, power, you know, I, I assume it's going to help with flying automobiles and all that kind of stuff. So um, power home. So how are we going to manage that? How are we going to manage um, a complete infrastructure change worldwide at the same time that all this other stuff is happening? And that's just nuclear fission. Um, I am, I'm assuming it could it could find some other game changing technologies, aside from the obvious like the health industry, mm. um, and that gets into like transhumanism, um, and um, so. Why don't you define transhumanism for us? Sure. Um, we got about ten minutes. Um, I'm gonna come up with a definition off the top of my head. This isn't a perfect definition, but essentially mm -hmm. it's the, um, the ability or the, the drive to improve who we are as humans through um, uh, essentially like upgrades to us. Okay. So like, um, um, so for example, the neural link chip, is is an upgrade to us right or we can um an, an industry that's coming from this um which it, uh, it, it's called um, biohacking or digital biology um this will probably be if 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 you still think you want to play the stock market look into digital um biology or or biohacking this will probably be the biggest industry in human history um and we're going to be tackling our biological problems like cancer and, and, and colds and uh, uh, memory problems and all these kind of things, instead of using um, biological biology type solutions, they'll be more like akin to digital solutions. So for example, um, printing um, um, DNA or, you know, things like that. So, um, and, and being able to just go in and correct our DNA if something's wrong or something. So, you know, we'll be able to go in and, and make corrections and it'll all be very, very, um, almost like you're, you're fixing a computer um, program versus a human. Yeah. Uh, so, so you're going to see that cross. And then imagine like we have the neural link technology. Um, the neural link technology is, is, 
is almost a, a certainty. In fact, it's already being worked on um, and um, the bugs are getting worked out. The big problem we have right now is bandwidth. So right now, when you ask your home computer assistant, you know, what's the weather, it will pause, pause and say the temperature outside is 72 degrees. That's kind of how it'll be in our brain right now. Like what's the capital of Mississippi? And then, then you'll be able to say, it. <clears throat> but once we, so there's a bandwidth problem. Once we solve that bandwidth problem where it's going from the brain to the chip or from the chip to the brain, we won't even notice it. It'll be seamless. So that's where we're like kind of in cyborg territory. Um, somebody well, asked, that, yeah, go ahead. That kind of brings up, uh, can, will, will then human beings be able to be hacked? Okay. Um, yeah. So I would, I would say we are already being hacked even without those chips. Hmm. Um, you probably mean more in a, like a literal computer way. Yeah. Um, in a, in a way hacking is, is sort of brainwashing and taking information and replacing it with the information that you want. Um, and so in a way that's being done now, absolutely. It can be done when we go digital. Now I, I don't think, I, I, I doubt, I mean, who knows? I, I don't know, but um, it depends on how things are designed. But um, in theory, yeah, we could be hacked, but hopefully they design the chips in such a way that that's not going to happen. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, yeah. you know, and, and even if they did, like super intelligence will come along and figure out a way to hack it and undo all that. So yeah, right. you, that that's a good question. Somebody asked me today, um, a friend that was over here at the house, he, he's like, well, will... Um, Will intelligence um, be able to, um, what do you say, like hallucinate? Now, we use the word hallucinate, like, because um, it does now. We call it hallucinating when it adds stuff to the images and mm. so it has six fingers, and it does that to the data too and things. Um, but he, but he meant like, like from a spiritual level, like will will AI get to the point where it can like and um, it will get spiritual and maybe start believing in God or um, you know those kind of things or uh, if it if it did mushrooms could it would it affect it you know those kind of things and, and these are questions that we don't know the answer to but um, I I think in a way it could because there's going to be so much crossover between the biology and the digital worlds. That there, that at least the biology will still have that capability, and then the digital will be part of processing that information. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I believe in a way it would. Okay, well, we've got about five minutes left, so I think we're going to uh, not start a new topic. But is there anything else that you'd like to convey regarding uh, some of the some of the threats, uh, midterm, long term? Um, anything else along these lines that you'd like to uh, talk to just, us about? Just real briefly, and this is almost a review as well, but, you know, I went up to 10 years. What about beyond 10 years? Obviously, a lot of that's unknown. It's going to depend on how we handle things today. Um, but it could lead to essentially a human insignificance. Humans can become insignificant in, in the world world or we could be eliminated um it just depends on the morality of the super intelligence depends on safeguards that we put in place um and our be and our ability to maintain those safeguards um <clears throat> and um you know the neural link stuff will become more and more prevalent this is um you know a lot of it now it's going to be just testing phases people that have diseases that you know this is the best option for them for their comfort for their uh life here um but eventually it's going to get to the point where you know i'm exaggerating but you can go to best buy and upgrade and now you're a cyborg you know um or what you know however we decide to do that most likely be like taking a pill or something like that so that's that's coming i don't know how soon after 10 years but um it's, it's hard to imagine that that wouldn't happen um, in the next 50 years, I'd say. So, um, yeah. Um, so that's about it. Okay. Um, yeah. Good. I think we'll wrap up there. So just to kind yeah. of give a preview for what we want to do in the next session, which I think will be our last one. I'm not sure. It's um, the one I'm excited about because it gives the solution. It gives the, the solutions to all this. And 
tells us what we can do about all this. So I'm kind of excited about it. I feel like a Debbie Downer with the, the first several sessions here, but the last one's the best. It tells us, you know, how we can think and do, and do it. But I'm sorry, go ahead. But No, well, yeah. that, yeah, that, go ahead and, and uh, sort of yeah. give a preview of that. Like, what can we do? Is it too late? How do we stop it? Can we stop it? Uh, how do we live in that kind of a world? Uh, yeah. What do we teach our kids? Um, how do we make those ethical decisions early enough uh, to be able to to manage this in our own lives, whatever the technology is doing. So, all yeah. right, Rick, well, thank you. And uh, we'll yeah, pick this up in the next session then. All right, appreciate it, man. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, fifth installment of this little podcast series that we're doing. My name is Ray Reek. I'm with Rick Allen, and uh, we're talking about AI. As you, if you've made it through all the rest of these, you're pretty aware of. <laughs> um, so we've gone through quite a bit thus far uh, from what is AI, where it's been, where it is now, uh, mm -hmm. where it's going potentially, um, some of the dangers involved in that, some of the good things that might come as a result of that. Um, but whichever way that goes, it's pretty apparent that uh, barring something unforeseen, it's going to be pretty revolutionary and, and societally societal changing in its effects. Um, so this episode, which may be our uh, final episode for the time being, uh, we want to talk about more of uh, our relation to AI on a personal level, on a familial level, uh, on an individual level. Um, there's a lot of things that we need to think about as this technology comes out into the culture um, to prepare, to make good choices. Um, and even we're going to consider today, even before on the individual level, is there really anything we can do at this point to stop it. Is it totally out of control already? Um, if is um, is it too late? Are we able to unplug it? So maybe we can start with there, Rick. Um, sort of give us an overview of what you think the possibility of um, either stopping or unplugging or really getting a hold of this thing before it gets out of control. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Ray. Um, yeah. So there, there's the what are the possibilities, and then kind of what's more realistic. So um, I'll, you know, start with the possibilities. So, you know, as, as mentioned previously, there is the center for AI safety. Um, there are some people out, out there speaking about this, um, uh, um, you know, like Elon Musk and you have the Google, um, see the, the guy who's in charge of AI for Google and others. Um, and um, it's, these people are anxiously trying to get the word out and um, they're not just focusing on uh, civilians or lay people, but governments and businesses. Um, and that may be very important. Um, you know, we, what generally what they're saying is we need to slow this way down. Um, some are saying stop it. I believe we should, we need to stop it right now and it's track. Um, I would side with those people. Um, because even when you're slowing down something that is extra exponential in growth, it's mm. still a fast growth. And, um, from our previous conversations, it, it should be obvious and aware, should be aware that we are right on the precipice of there's no turning back or there's no turning it off, so to speak, um, uh, where it can outsmart us um, and where it went that it will outsmart us. Um, so we're right there. Um, some people are saying seven years. A lot of people are saying 10 years. Um, people that think it's way off in the future are saying 50 years, <laughs> which isn't that far off. Um, and so, you know, what needs to be, happen then? 
Um, really what needs to happen is the businesses that are pushing this and driving this for profit um, need to decide that they're going to do the ethical thing and stop. Um, and they're going to need to do that across the board. Um, whether we have to force that through legislation or through um, uh, basically guilty consciencing these these uh, businesses, these businesses on on stopping it, um, I don't know. Um, the problem, one problem I see with just getting the government to do it is that, um, or any of these solutions really is who follows that law who who's going to do that really who's going to um because again this isn't all, only happening in the united states are we going to off, offshore it or are the ones that are in other countries are they going to um ramp it up then and leave us in the dust you know are companies that are in the united states are they going to stand for that you know what i th i think generally speaking we we know that if countries are companies are in another country and they're advancing in the technologies we're going to do something about that whether we're going to move to another country or we're going to secretly uh develop our tech so it's a it's a very difficult thing to to slow down um and, and stop um so personally i kind of think we sh we needed to do this 10 years ago 20 years ago um but it is what it is. We're here. We are, um, and so thankfully, you know, we do have some very high up there people speaking out, um, and they're organizing. But I, if you can, if you can tell me a way that they can actually stop it, I'd love to hear it. I, I really would. I, I, we need to take a solution that will actually be effective and, and utilize it. I'm just having trouble picturing it. You know, I don't, I don't see how that could happen. Um, look at global warming, whether or not you think that's a threat or not, the world, you know, united and to some degree we slowed it down here in the United States, right? We kind of leveled off uh, on our emissions or however you want to measure that. But we know that in other countries, they, they just completely ignored all that. So even if, you know, so, and this is, that was a, we all know how big of a push to stop global warming actually mm -hmm. was it, it was humongous and i don't think the ai push is nearly as big as that right now so um so that's that's kind of the what in, in a perfect world what can be done what could we do is is to convince businesses to stop um so then you get into well what's realistic <laughs> you know let's let's just assume because we kind of have to we, we have to take worst case scenario here. We don't want to just say take best case scenario. That's kind of uh, irresponsible in my opinion. So what about worst case scenario? Let's say the government fails. They, they fail to get the word out and businesses continue to push as they currently are. Um, then you get into more drastic measures. Um, I've, I've come up with two solutions. One of them is something humans can do. And one of them is something left up to nature. Um, and again, if anybody can come up with other solutions, I'd love to hear it. Um, the co a common misconception is we'll just unplug it. But hopefully, as we've been talking, you can understand why that doesn't make sense. Um, it's in it's basically almost in every browser and every um, most software programs are integrating it now. Um, you have governments implementing it in their um in in their just their day-to-day -day, but also in the militaries and across the board it's just everywhere so what do you what do you unplug exactly what is it that you're right. unplugging um I, I don't know that there is anything really at this point but um let's just pretend for a minute minute that you could unplug it okay well that's right now like if you were going to, so it has to get to the point where we decide we need to unplug it, but it has to be at the point where we can unplug it. It has to be in that sweet spot. So um, if we have AGI in say um, three years, um, I'll even say, let's say four years, if we have AGI in three to four years, which it'll probably be before that, honestly, um, I would say with an AGI, theoretically, we can still unplug things in those three to four years. But unfortunately, 
in that AGI time period is when everything's going to be awesome. You know, it's about to get really cool. It's mm -hmm. going to make everybody's lives better. We're going to be able, oh my gosh, I can buy a robot that cleans my floor. I can, I can buy the software program that will, or subscribe to the software program that will make my job a thousand times easier and better. Uh, we're going to be living in a land of luxury in a, in a way over these next three or four years. So, it's so we're like not going to unplug it. It's kind of like the buzz when you're drinking before you get sloppy drunk and start puking. Yes. yes. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, Ray, but I, I, I've seen a movie. So, yeah, I've just I, heard about that. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> we, we've been watching some interesting movies. Yeah. yeah. Um, so obviously where I'm going with that is after the AGI period, now you get into super general intelligence. Um, well, why can't we unplug it then? Because it's w way smarter than us. AI right now knows that we intend to unplug it if it goes awry. It, it, it knows that's a possibility. It knows people are co contemplating it and thinking about it and, and deciding whether or not that's something they can do. It's certainly going to know that in the AGI phase, but super general intelligence phase, you know, in however many years, four to 10 years, unquestionably, it will not only know that, will it, it will it will probably come up on its own with all the ways that we could dismantle it. And if it's so inclined, it will do something about it to prevent us from being able to do that. So it will multiply itself. It will push itself out into areas we don't even know it's at. Um, a, lot, a lot of people don't realize, like, even our electrical system <laughs> um, is able to send and receive data. Our, our your house wired if you don't have internet just your electrical you know through the electrical grid um data and information can reside there um it's it's not something that we utilize but that's something that can be done um and so ai can get even more creative with that um and find ways to hide itself and and even think of this um Knowing that we might want to turn it off at some point, it might behave in a way where it doesn't threaten us. And so it will it'll seem tame and helpful and all this, knowing and watching that, hey, they might want to unplug me. So it will it can it will be able to prepare much better than we can even imagine how it could prepare for. You know, mm -hmm. we we won't be able to outsmart it in this regard once it gets to that level. So if we're going to unplug it, we're going to need to do it in the time frame of where we don't want to unplug it because it's nice. It's, yeah. it's, it's helpful. Um, so there's that. Um, so then you get into the more, what about it gets past that point and now it's out of control. What do we do? Um, I've come up with two solutions. Maybe there's more. One of them is, um, um, using um, electromagnetic pulse. So exploding um, electromagnetic pulse weapons over basically the whole world. I was going to suggest that actually. <laughs> I'm sorry? I was going to suggest that actually. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now I, I will say that's not a perfect solution, but, but I think it's one of, it's probably, it's the best I've come up with that humans can take care of. Of course, that, that would knock us back in the Stone Age effectively. Well, but... that's the problem. So we, we've already done calculations, and I'll tell you why we've done these calculations in a minute, that in the United States alone, 90% of us will die within the first year if if that were to happen. Um, because, you know, we're not going to have access to food and water and medicines and transportation and communications and heat and cold. And, and it's we're going to be in the Stone Ages. Um, all at once, like just like that. And a lot of people are going to die um, just in the first year, 90%. Uh, some people in the third world countries, they might actually be better off because mm -hmm. they might be more used to that. Um, so, so we could do that. Now, why do I say that's not perfect? Well, even if you did it really well, again, Guarantee you, super general intelligence ha will have predicted that this is a possible way that we want, want to turn it off. And if we decide to do it, it's going to know. How are we going to communicate that we're going to do that? I mean, it would have to be a really um, secretive operation, first of all, really secretive. It have to be 
off the internet, no, you know, no electronic, you know, it would, it would be an interesting thing to pull off, first of all. But um, assuming the AI uh, uh, predicted that this could be a possibility, again, it could do things, you know, we have underground places, you know, there are places it could, it could hide. Um, and so um, it can hide and wait until we rebuild the in infrastructure. And if we're not careful and we don't notice it, it could just respawn. And there it is again. Um, another way is a natural way. And it's pretty much the same solution. Um, there's the a coronal mass ejection, which is when the sun is faced. Um, there's a, a, a coronal ejection from the sun heads towards the earth at right at just the right time angle and um, the right amount. And that would come if that were to happen in a big enough way, um, it could knock out all of our power, all of our battery systems all at once. That's happened before. I think it was about 150 years ago. Um, when it didn't matter. <laughs> well, right. It didn't matter a whole lot. Now, we did have a telegraph system in place, and it knocked it out. And we had to rebuild the telegraph system. Even something as basic as that, we had to rebuild it. You can't just turn it back on again. You have mm -hmm. to strip it and rebuild it. Um, this is a very possibility. They call that a hundred year event, but it's already been 150 years. And there's, I forget the percentage. It's probably every 10 years, we have about a 13% chance of it actually happening. This is a thing that people don't realize. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that it, it is a potential concern. And um, I believe two presidents have been informed about it and wanted to rebuild our grid because we can build our power grid in such a way that it will protect us and protect the grid. Um, but it takes money. And um, my understanding is the power industries use lobbyists to stop it from happening. So we've never done that. China and Russia have done that in parts, is my understanding. They've, in, in parts of their power grid, they've, they've um, strengthened them so that if there is, if this event does happen, they'll be safe. Um, which might backfire if we have to do it intentionally. Um, but um, so this is a real threat. This isn't like, this is something that our government has considered doing. Other governments have to some degree ap actually implemented this because this is a real threat to us. Um, so that would, if it was powerful enough, shut everything down and we'd have to rebuild everything. But it's the same thing, 90% of us die and whatever. And this is something that could happen regardless. This is not necessarily an AI thing. This is something that we need to be prepared for. Um, so those are the solutions that I've come up with. If you have more, send them to somebody important <laughs> right away. If you have you know. solutions, put them into the comments and uh, or we'll call your sure congressman or <laughs> yeah. some, do something. We'll pass it on to the, right. to the president. Because right. we're <laughs> just like this with them, right? <laughs> Right. Sure. <laughs> All right. Uh, if Is there anything else on that front that, that you wanted to talk about? You've given us your two solutions. I'd, I'd love to talk with people in the know more about that. I'd love to hear ideas and solutions. I wish I, I, I like to, I don't like to be the kind of person I just present a problem without a solution. And right. uh, the whole kind of the whole ba basis of this conversation is the solutions are hard to come by. Mm -hmm. um, that's why it's kind of like red alert status. I'd love yeah. to be in more of those conversations, so, but I don't, unfortunately I don't have anything else to offer in that regard for this podcast. So. Okay. Well, you know, that being the case, um, what do we as individuals do, do with this? Um, when we, when we, you know, maybe we're starting to go through the phase where we're seeing all these new uh, shiny things that are coming down the pike that we think are really great. People are getting, prosthetic limbs that that work wonderfully uh mm -hmm. we don't have to wash the dishes anymore um you know self-driving cars obviously which i'm not a big fan of but a lot of people would like that and for some people right. i think i would like them to have that uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, but um so you know when these things start coming down the pike how do we need to prepare ourselves what can we do to protect ourselves what do we teach our kids about this how do we guard them against uh, them because they're in a world that has never been without it really, especially younger children. How do we teach them that this isn't the default setting like of reality, you know? Uh, right. Right. So, uh, yeah. you know, this how do you look at this stuff? Even now, we're not reliving real life. Right. right. Yeah. yeah so, so what do we do? Yeah. Um, great question. So um, 
The first thing I would do um, uh, physically, the first physical thing I would do is prepare as reasonably and as best as you can for off-grid living. Um, I just gave you a couple of the potential solutions um, and those are solutions to stopping it. But what if, what if it gets out of hand in 10 years and we are threatened physically by AI in some way, or let's just say the economy collapses because all these changes, changes are happening so quickly. We can't adapt. We can't fix our, uh, economic system or our electronic or, or uh, um, electrical system quick enough to keep up with all this. And it just causes a financial collapse or economic collapse. Um, I think it's a real threat that we need be, to be prepared for, for all of those reasons. And even forget about computers or AI, you know, the coronal um, uh, mass ejection is, is a possibility if you weren't aware of that. So these kind of things, you need to be prepared to be thrown in the dark ages real quick. Um, I, I do see a lot of people kind of preparing um, and I will include myself in this. Most people aren't preparing enough. Um, what are you going to do about water? Are you going to be able to get to it um, efficiently? Or, or clean water that you can drink. A lot of us do not have access to that. Um food stored up for long periods of time and, and, and sustainable where you can continue to keep growing it. Um, you know, in my family, we've done a number of things. Like we have a, um, a, a go bag, you know, like a three to four day go bag and I'm building a one for a longer term. Um, but even if we're stay put, like, is our garden going to be able to sustain us? Are we going to have access to water? All those kind of things. So that's kind of a, I won't say easy, but that's kind of a no brainer um, thing where it's kind of like the low lying fruit solution. What can I do that even if nothing happens, I'll still be kind of ahead in case mm -hmm. any kind of c catastrophe happens. So um, it's kind of covers all your bases. So that's one thing I would recommend to everybody. Um, then another thing is, um, how we teach our children um, and, and prepare our children, which, which you brought up. Um, one thing I've done with my kids over the years is um, I try to at least equip them um, for survival type things, how to hunt, how to fish, how to grow things. We, we've just scratched the surface and my kids are just reaching the age where we can really start to go do this more. Um, so um, preparing them for that, but also preparing them emotionally. Um, even if this AI thing were to never happen, I'm really concerned about the emotional state of children these days. And as they raise, as they get older into young adulthood, um, there's a suicide epidemic. Uh, people, kids just are not prepared emotionally to handle stress. They're just not, um, you know, like, um, I don't want to get any kind of political here, but like even bullying, like when we grew up, bullying was just kind of natural, but it served a purpose. It, I'm not, I'm not suggesting we should promote bullying, of course, but the way we handle things today makes kids very soft. And if we lived in a Star Trek world, that might be okay. But the, the, the you're gambling there that we're going to be living in a safe protective Star Trek world when reality is um, things can go awry at any moment and, and kids need to be prepared. So I would, I would suggest preparing kids emotionally um, how to do that. I'm not going to suggest how to do that. If somebody wants to get hold of me privately, they're welcome to, but um, you know, everybody has their different methods for that. But that, I think that's extremely important building up their emotional intelligence. Um, also teaching kids to recognize truth and understand what is truth, what is reality and what is not reality, what is opinion and what is fact. Those kind of things are extremely important as we enter this age of misinformation. We're, we're going to enter the misinformation age. It's one of the labels you could probably put on this upcoming age, in my opinion. Um, not just the artificial intelligence age, not just the biotech age, but it's going to be a misinformation age. What we see, what we hear, it's going to be unreliable. It's already started. My parents in Florida received a phone call from me in my voice 
it wasn't me. It was some, somebody cloned my voice and this is happening. Wow. Um, yeah. So, um, and that's going to get a lot more prevalent. In fact, it'll get to the point where it'll be video. Um, it's there's some of the video out there is incredible mm -hmm. that you'll be able to basically replicate a person on the screen and have them speak to you. So um, there's going to be a huge amount of that and children need to be able to, and this is why we had the candid camera conversation. People need to be able to be able to discern um, fact from fiction um, in all aspect, aspects of their life. Um, I think that's a critical thing. Um, so I've had conversations. We've talked about magic. We've talked about politics and the media, how it can spend things. All those kind of things are important. Always questioning when somebody tells you something, um, maybe not questioning to their face, but questioning for yourself and, and, and researching it and making sure that you're picking reliable sources and what they're saying is in fact true. So I think that's incredibly important um, to prepare. Um, and then another thing I would say is um, sticking together with other people, whether it be other families, other uh, friends, um, building little communities. Um, right now, we, we kind of live in a world where everything's open and we have a couple friends we loosely are friends with at school or at church or at work or at the sporting event. Um, but think about how things were back in the day. You know, I always think the, the, the thing that sent us in this direction was when we invented the wheel um, because it allowed us to travel and move out. And we, we weren't beholden. We weren't, we, we weren't, um, it, those relationships became less and less important as once the will was developed. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and as now we have flight and we have, you know, all these other ways of, of escaping from our re personal interpersonal responsibilities um i would suggest bringing that back make close 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 friends uh if you're able be close to your family people that you can trust people that have similar values that you have um teach each other support each other be there for each other go back and, let's go back let's go back to the way things were um and undergird our lives with, with, um, with these relationships. Yeah, I think that's uh, really something critical. Even if AI were to disappear tomorrow, uh, we become so atomized, and as as we have more avenues of communication, as we're able to travel farther and more freely, um, the paradox is is that we are often more alienated and lonely uh, than we ever have been in human history. And, um, you know, the anxiety rates in children, um, the divorces in adults, uh, the mental illness in the country, you know, there's, there's not one reason for that. Um, but certainly a huge contributing factor to that has been that people are alone, that people don't have a close social network. They don't have a community uh, they don't have the, you know, the village where everybody attends the same church and everybody goes to the same store. Um, you know, so many of us live in developments where we don't even know who our neighbors are. Right. And we really never tried <laughs> to find out who they are because yeah. instead we drive 30 miles away to go see these other people that we'd rather be around. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I, I think that that really is so critical. Um, and, you know, especially I think, um, it's gotten much harder because fewer people do go to church where there's a sense of community. Um, and so a lot of civic organizations that used to form community, even if they were maybe, you know, like, uh, same sex, uh, communal places, um, you know, civic groups and organizations that did good things in the community. Those have largely fallen by the wayside compared to where they were 60, 70, 80 years ago. Uh, so a lot of those spaces that we used to have that were uh, integral to the fabric of of a, a community and of society have have been winnowed away. 
and everything that we do is now either online or we drive a long distance and we generally are in those spaces for not very long. You know, maybe it's a kid's basketball game and we see these people for half an hour to an hour. Um, and I think that's, that, um, that is really sucking our humanity away. And I think it's one reason why AI is uh, such a danger because we don't even realize what we've already traded off. Um, and so we're, we're going to tend to embrace this uh, because we don't know any better. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, a good friend of mine said, would you please stop saying that, it, um, you know, we're, it's a danger to humanity because it just scares people. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know any other way to say it. It's a danger to humanity. It's not like a, a, a mild threat. <laughs> you know, I think we've already damaged humanity in a large way and this can potentially take it to the extreme as, as we become one with the technology or if the technology physically threatens us, either way, humanity will change. We will not be the same kind of human as we were. Imagine somebody with this tech in their brain and they have the super intelligence and they're able to function and they're able to, this, this is something I haven't mentioned yet, but like, you know, there was a man, I think it was in Antarctica, he was a surgeon and he actually performed a surgery on himself because there was no one else around. He couldn't get out of it. Well, that could be commonplace at some point because everybody could potentially be the world's greatest surgeon, right? Because we'll right. have the knowledge and we will be able to um, invent the, the sedatives or the painkillers necessary that we can upgrade ourselves. We can, Hey, I, I want faster legs. I can replace my legs or, or whatever the thing is, um, you know, biohacking, could very well be a thing that comes in the in the near future. I, I think that, you know, nothing happens in a vacuum and AI didn't come out of a vacuum um, either. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's been coming on for a long time, but we as a society have been moving in this direction where we are becoming less connected to the natural world and more reliant mm -hmm. on technology, which has made us softer and less actually able to interact intelligently with the natural world, which is something that are that was uh, just par for the course for our ancestors. Um, you know, I'm I'm not a hunter. You know, if I often have, you know, I get really disgusted at the the modern world sometimes, and I get disgusted with my job and with you know the marketing world, and some and sometimes I just have this like, you know what. I'm just going to go off in a cabin somewhere. I'm going to get like a little plot of land and I'm just going to like, you know, this is my, uh, my rejection of civilization. I'm going to become a Luddite. And, and, but then I think like, okay. Like Ted Kaczynski. Sorry. Like Ted Kaczynski. Right. Right. Well, not exactly like him, I'm not okay. gonna anything right. for anybody, but, okay. okay. Gotcha. <laughs> but, but, that, but then that, I think, that. but then I think I would be dead in two weeks. Because like I'm not a great gardener, I don't know about soil. I don't know about fertilizer. I you know I'm not a hunter. Um, about three days in, I'd be like, man, I'd really like some sushi. You know, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know anybody. Um, um, I can't remember the author now. Is a famous author that supposedly lived on the pond by himself for a while. Thoreau, Henry David Thoreau. There you go, Thoreau. And I read that whole book. And I was like, wow, that's, a, that's awesome. That's amazing. Right. And right. then I heard later that his aunt lived two miles down the road. Yeah. And he would often go and resupply there. Yeah, right. Uh, I'm like, oh, that just ruined the whole book for me. <laughs> right. And there was a guy in Africa, you know, he was on like NPR, or PBS or whatever. And you could see videos of him surviving out in, in Alaska. But he would get flight drops of, of supplies. You know, it's really hard to survive on your own. Yeah, it is. It's how difficult yeah, it is. Even our <laughs> heroes that have done that. You know, I, I've... You know, I think that 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 comes down to um, to building a community again, because, you know, even back when our ancestors weren't as reliant on technology as we are, they did live in communities, whether it was tribes or villages or small towns or, you know, nomadic uh, clans. Uh, there were all these people that sort of worked together to the common good. And um, not that we should necessarily be looking for friends like I really need to find a friend who's a plumber or I need to find a friend who's good at hunting. But 
You know what? When you have a really good community, people have different strengths. And in a time of need, if you have developed those relationships over the course of time, um, you are going to be more resilient in numbers than you will be by yourself. And um, I, I think that's good for our physical resilience. And it's also good for our mental and spiritual and, and emotional resilience as well um, to have that that network of people. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think that's good. Um, so I, I just have one one more thing to add to this. Yeah. So people often say, well, Rick, why are you so afraid? Like, you know, I, I'm a I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. Um, and people like, why are you not trusting in God? Like, why are you so afraid? Guys, I'm not afraid. I, I've been thinking about this for 30 for 35 years plus, And um, it's not something I'm afraid of. It's something I think we should do something about to save humanity. But um, at the end of the day, you know, we're all in this together. And um, my God, teach, the, the most common phrase in the Bible is fear not. I think mm -hmm. there's 365 variations of the phrase fear not. It's a command from God to say, do not be afraid. Um, and I, I believe that. I don't think we have to go into this being afraid. I think we need to go into this being prepared, being wise, and uh, being knowledgeable. Um, we may or may not get through this as far as a race, but I know at the end of the day, um, it's all part of the plan, and um, I'm okay with that. You know, so I'm not suggesting this is not this whole thing is not about fear mongering and trying to get people afraid. It's about getting making people aware and understanding what's coming so that they can be prepared. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think that's uh, that's some good advice to leave this with. Um, do you have anything else you want to add before we wrap this this episode up? I don't other than to thank you, Ray. Um, on short notice, you just you uh, agreed to do this with me. And uh, uh, I, I just I had a feeling you were the guy, so and and you were. So I really appreciate you um, taking time to prepare for all this and to uh, join me in these conversations. Thank, Thank you, you, Rick. I uh, I appreciate you asking me to do this, and hopefully it helps somebody. If not, it maybe helped us to sort of formulate these thoughts for ourselves and and what to do next. So, um, thank you, Rick. Maybe we'll uh, connect again on this issue or or something else. Uh, but in the meantime, this is probably the last episode of this particular series and glad for everybody who joined us and uh please um feel free to write something in the comments or comment or give us your suggestions on how to save the world from ai and, and, and <laughs> so ask we, questions yeah all that yeah. spread the word out We're, i think i'd like to make this into one video if you could share the video with with whoever you think might need it if business owners definitely need to hear this but whoever you can get it to, uh, po politicians, whoever, at least if not this video, uh, find something similar to send to them. Please get that word out. All right. Well, thank you, Rick. We'll wrap it thank up. Thank you, Rick. Uh, right. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.